Rye here in Amsterdam. Cannot believe it's the final afternoon. We are literally watching the last hours of the show tick by, but we are so glad to have all of you with us. Remember, keep reaching out on social media using hashtag Cisco Live EMEA. We want to hear from every single one of you. And right now, we are going to keep talking IP fabric because here in the studio with me, I have got Jacob Aldasir here with me, head of central marketing for IP fabric, along with Alex Giddings, solutions architect with IP Fabric. Gentlemen, how did you get away to spend time with us here in the studio? How did that happen? How did it happen? Well, it was the invitation. When we had the invitation, we couldn't say no. <laughs> That's Oh, if only it was that easy in my life the rest of the way. I invite people and they say yes, but it's not that easy. I'm so glad to have all of you here with me. All right, let's talk to what we just heard in the iTalk here. What do you think made CRS and CRG pursue network assurance as a solution in the first place. So why did they need it if they've already got all these other tools that they could be working with? Yeah, it's a common theme um, that we see repeatedly through a number of our customers is that there are a lot of specialist tools delivering a vast amount of useful information for network operations, network management, et cetera. Um, but when you start moving, when you need to move away into greater detail and get a better overview of what your network estate looks like, you need something that gives you that kind of almost although I don't necessarily like the phrase, single pane of glass yep. view of this, which is effectively what you know, IP Fabric delivers. It unifies all of that information coming in and then presents it in a human, easy to understand human friendly, shall we say, uh, manner. Yeah, the idea of the platform is to be as easy to use as possible. So depend if you've got a complex data center infrastructure and a complex WAN, you can see it all in one view and be able to easily see how your users are interacting and if there's anything in the network that may be causing issues so that people can start troubleshooting easier, faster, and get to root cause as soon as possible. We spend so much time talking about reduction of complexity, right? How do we simplify the process? And I always think that this is the outreach to our customers. We can explain things all over the place. When we say, look at how easy it is to use. You've got it all right in front of you. It just makes perfect sense. All of a sudden, adoption skyrockets and people get it. It's like the light bulb goes off, right? Um, let's take a step back for a moment. I want to take a big picture approach. Explain network assurance for us, right? Let's just make it fundamental here. Right, so I'm going to take this from a little bit of a marketing Great. and sales perspective, So, uh, and then I'll hand over to, to Alex. But you know, uh, at its core, really what network assurance is, is, is being able to take a look at the network and identify, is this as a whole operating in the way I intended? Is it delivering functionality, value, to the business in the way that we expect based on the configurations we push out, the setup that we do, and validate that effectively. Hmm? Yeah, we have a number of customers that are governed by compliance regulations and different areas in different parts of the world and it makes it quite difficult sometimes with multitudes of different technologies to be able to see in one view the compliance of the, of the, the network, the assurance, is it doing what it should be doing? And is there anything that we need to look at or focus on before the auditors come in and we get a, a slap on the wrist? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, let's talk about reference architecture a little bit. What sort of bef uh, uh, benefits does a reference architecture framework uh, offer to our customers who might be considering an approach like the one that we're talking about here? Okay, so we've often found in our customers that are pursuing a network automation architecture or moving towards network automation, we find that to be able to deliver network automation, you first need to know what your network looks like. And to be able to find out what your network looks like, IP Fabric's great, we, we connect multitudes of different technologies and we can provide the view, and then you can provide that information to tools that allow you to derive intent from your network, deliver the the automation and deliver the intent to the network, uh, like tools like Cisco NSO, et cetera. Um, but without that information of what does it look like now, there's no way to easily and steadily get to the position of being able to deliver that intent without the observed state. Does that seem to be a big conversation that the two of you and the rest of your team are having over at IP Fabric here in the world of solutions this week? Of course, yes. We deliver part of that solution but there's many other tools. We don't do everything. Right. We'd like to integrate with Cisco products, et cetera, to be able to deliver parts of that reference architecture that really make a difference. We're one part of the puzzle. We want to integrate with the tools, the teams that are able to deliver 
value to their customers using the products that they're used to or like. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Did you want to add something yeah, on to it, Jacob? Mean, Sorry. Just, yeah, it's just, you know, it's this life cycle view of what network automation really is. You know, we talk about it as a single term, but effectively it's made up of a number of components. And one of those components, as Alex mentioned, is assurance. But then you need tools that are going to do the orchestration or tools that do the fulfillment and actually deliver that intent, that the config and uh, the setup of the network. And it's only when those three are effectively working in harmony in a cycle, ah that you can deliver that network automation you know, as a whole. So you have to take a holistic approach in order to get to the full impact of the benefit, or let's say maximize on the potential benefit. Yeah, it's, it's the ideal, let's say it's the ideal state mm -hmm. in, in our eyes of how to effectively deliver or be able to have you know, an automated network. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, let's look at IPF as a platform. How is delivering value to our customers today? So, for example, IP Fabric is able to discover multitudes of, of Cisco customers' networks because the different platforms that Cisco has, got from the data center to the WAN to many other uh, security, for example, IP Fabric is, is, is able to provide a holistic view of the entire network from site to site mm -hmm. as you transition between those different technologies and domains in one view so that if you do have issues in your network, if there is spanning tree problems, if there are security policies that are preventing your users from having a good experience, we're able to provide that in one view. Um, so being able to allow the, we, we call it mean time to innocence, being able to <laughs> allow the, the network en engineer to say it's not my fault, it, it's, it, it, it's a security team, it's the cloud team, for example. It reminds me of the whole blame the network, I always blame the network, exactly. it's not my fault, not my fault. Um, Tell me about the difference between network assurance and network automation. These are two different things, but do they cross over with one another? And if so, how do they do that? Yeah, so it comes a little bit back to what I was saying earlier about network automation effectively being an end state, right? What you're looking for, and we did use the term at one point, you know, the self-driving network. That's kind of what you imagine that network automation delivers. The, you tell it what you want it to do, and it effectively, it happens, right, in the background without requiring a huge amount of, you know, human involvement. Um, that's a really big, goal and it's also a really big dream and it takes you know, a lot of tools and a lot of effort to put something like that together. Network assurance is effectively one part of that journey and you can't you know, automate, you can't do a lot of things without knowing where am I starting from? What do I have? What state is it in? How is it set up and what is that delivering at the moment? So it's effectively like wanting to get somewhere, you need to know the starting point where you're leaving from. So assurance kind of delivers that this is the point we're at now but it certainly doesn't limit itself to that, right? Because as soon as you start making changes to the network or the setup, you can continue to take snapshots of it, compare them to what was done in the past, oh. and see how that difference is impacted, you know, the way that network functions as a whole. This has got to feel very empowering for customers that are using IP Fabric capabilities, because I'm sure that, e uh, that both of you are asked questions all the time, that are along the lines, how do I get there, how do I get there, how do I get there, if you can show that to them, does it mean just automatic adoption at that point? Sometimes. <laughs> it's very difficult. Sometimes it's, it's a generational pro issue, sometimes oh. it's a, a, uh, um, an organization uh, change within the environment. Getting the product in is, is the first step. Once you have the visibility, it's easy for them to then progress on that journey. How do you convince management that this is the tool we need? How are we going to save uh, operation hours, for example? So my favorite thing to always end an interview or a conversation with is what can our customers look forward to moving forward? We've got a very busy 2024 ahead, Gen AI, we're hearing about it all over the map. I know it's impacting what you guys are doing as well. What can we tell people, keep your eyes open, follow us because what? Well, I'll kick off with that. I think from my perspective is what we're doing is we're trying to make as much of the amount, vast amounts of complex information we basically pull in from the network as humanly understandable as possible and build as much logic above that so that it means that it's easier for a network engineer, infrastructure, for architects to understand and gain value from that information. Collecting information is one thing, interpreting it is really complex. Being able to deliver the value of interpreting it for them to save time, that's a really huge part of what we're working on. And then obviously, as you can imagine, when we say you know, we work with very complex networks that span hybrid environments, et cetera, 
then basically always and always expanding what the product and platform is able to effectively absorb from information sources, right? So meaning it's more and more complete and there's less and less of uh, elements that will meet the customer's network where we say, okay, we still don't support maybe that element or this thing, right? So making sure it is as holistic as possible. I love that, I love that. Alex, Jacob, really appreciate the two of you being here with us. Congratulations, I hope you've had a great time here at the show. Every time I walk by, you guys are very busy, so well done. Thank, Thank you very much, much. it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you guys both so much for coming in. We are going to take a very short break at this point. When we return, Nish Parker will be sitting down with Nieves Navarro and Goethe Brücker, and we're going to take a behind the scenes look at why you want to be here with us for Cisco Live in EMEA. We'll be right back. We're here at Cisco Live 2024 Amsterdam, and as Steve said, we're here now with Nieves and with Kerd. I'm so excited because you're going to give us a behind the scenes of this amazing event. How are you both doing? Great, thank you. We're delighted to be here. Thanks, Nieves. How about Wonderful, you? and it's already Thursday, right? <laughs> I know. I mean, every time we say we start out the event, we're super excited for the week. Before we know it, it's over. Um, Nieves, I've got to spend lots of time with you, which is great, and we saw each other in the keynote space at the beginning of the week. I think you were the first person that I spoke to this week, and you're coming into the closing day as well. Excellent. So I asked you then, what is it like to be a first-time Cisco Live attendee? How do you feel towards the end of the week? It's been epic. Honestly, it's been a fantastic week. Um, it's been so wonderful to, um, to network and interact with customer partners, of course, meet our colleagues, um, and, but also hear feedback firsthand for our customers and partners. Just the, 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 um, the energy is, you know, the moment you walk into the building, there's just a palpable energy. Um, it's all over. Um, you walk around and people are just talking and interacting and just the amount of, um, of um, the great environment is, is really been amazing. Um, so really, really a superb week. And of course, I'm looking forward to the party tonight as well. It's going to be a lot of fun, right? If you haven't had a chance to catch up with people while you're here at Cisco Live, seeing them at the party is always a great way to make sure you yes. connect with as many people as possible. Um, now, Ked, I know your team has been making an impact with Cisco Live year after year. I don't know how many events you and your team have run, but it's a lot, right? Actually, I'm uh, almost 14 years at Cisco, so I think it's my 12th uh, oh, Cisco wow. Live now. So uh, yeah, I have a little bit more experience than uh, <laughs> yeah, with the event. Uh, yes. That, uh, so tell me, what's the highlights that you've experienced this yeah. year? For me, what uh, really stands out for me this year actually is actually uh, the feedback that the team has taken from last year right. and how we actually put that all in the overall user experience. And we can talk a lot about technology and that other technical experts will do all of that, let's say. But what we also as a team want to create is actually the ideal environment for the people that are here to be able to educate themselves and to network. And that goes from loads and loads of coffee and soft drinks, let's yes. say to all the catering, the, the internet connectivity, the lounges, just to making sure actually that they feel at home and can use the best uh, time they have here. Absolutely, I mean, walking around the world, solutions around the hub as well, you can really see everybody's taking advantage of every spot around the floor, whether it's like you said, to grab a quick coffee, or maybe it's doing a certification or an exam whilst Absolutely. they're here. There are so many things to do this week. Definitely not a shortage. Um, now, Nieves, I know you're relatively new to Cisco and our new VP of um, <coughs> EMEA Marketing. You've probably been to a lot of different events in the industry. I'm sure you're no stranger to those. What is unique about Cisco Live? I think the magnitude um, of, of the event um, is very unique, but also how it comes together, because with such a, such a big event, I think you run the risk of things being disconnected and, and you feel like there are different areas and you're not, you're not seeing the flow. But I think the team has done a fantastic job of putting together just a, a, an amazing flow, like her was saying, different spaces for interacting, all the different activities uh, and the energy. I mean, like I said earlier, it, it, you walk in and you just feel it. So I think the magnitude and just the, the, the environment uh, really, really stands out for me. And I love the, the graphics. I just love the different colors. It just, it's like, you know, just very invigorating. It's very vibrant, right? Yes. And it makes you, it energizes you and you can't help but have a good time when you're surrounded by this much color and energy, as you said. Um, now, obviously, with such a big event, you know, we're talking 16,000 people here in person, we have to ensure that we are having a positive impact here. And I know sustainability is something that 
Cisco yep. continues to be focused on. It's a priority for a lot of our customers, but here at the event as well. So Ked, I know you and your team take this into account and embed it I mean, right from the start. Tell us about that yeah, journey. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I have two people in the team, actually, Joanne and Trisha, let's say, that are leading, leading these efforts, and they are completely passionate about it. And that comes through in the event, let's say. So as an example, already last year, the team won an award, let's say, as the best sustainable event in the industry, just Amazing. as a demonstration to do that. And this year, again, they take it to the next level. They take it up a notch. And that goes from, from the fabric, the cardboards that we are using, like let's say the cutlery, kind of reusable cups and all of that, really always with sustainability in mind. Also from a catering perspective and all of that. So I'm so grateful to have two people that are so passionate. Of course, it's a full team that comes together, but we need to do the right thing for the industry and for our environment. So, uh, and uh, I'm so proud that we are leading in that. For sure, and it's been amazing as well to see sustainability here on the show floor. We've had so many demos here in the world of solutions. It's built into a lot of our technology, and I know that's one of the big outcomes. You know, whether it's energy consumption or you know, I'm um, using different suppliers. There's so many different things here at the show for customers and for partners to take away, as well as, of course, attending the show in a sustainable and responsible way. Um, now, I hear time and time again when I have people here in the studio, one of the things that they love to do is connect with their peers, with other customers. So what opportunities have you seen so far walking around for customers to be able to interact with each other? Yeah, I mean, there are plenty of them. And they are the customer success stories, really customers telling about their experience uh, with the Cisco technology and evangelizing that, let's say. But you have meet the engineers, you have to meet the executive, the networking, the peers, the connectivity, the app to connect people. So this is, this is it's not just about the technical education. Here you need to come to talk to people, to network, to the people who build the products. And that's the power of an event like this as well. For sure, I mean, they can hear from Cisco people through the demos, through the speaking sessions. I know we had a lot of executives um, in our sessions as well, right? We saw that on the keynote stage with HSBC. So you really do come to Cisco Live, not only hear from Cisco, but from other customers and real life use cases on how they are using Cisco technology. I know we've hopped over a couple of times, just two doors down in the, um, in the hub here to the customer success theater. So we've had 20 different customers there across industries, different sizes, really share a very diverse set of stories on how they are using our technology. So I know we hear that feedback time and time again. They love to hear from Cisco, love to hear and interact with partners, but also from each other. Okay, um, so the next question I have for you is, for people that aren't here this year. So people that are watching from home and they're probably sitting there, hopefully if we've done a good job, they are sitting there and thinking, that is a really cool event, but what is it that you want to say to them to ensure that they come back next year if they haven't been this year? Or if they're new, why, why come here in Amsterdam on site? I would say come and be part of something amazing. There is so much to see, to learn, to be part of, like you know all the stuff that Hurt has mentioned, plus we had Besides all the sessions and keynote, we have Partner Day on Monday, which was an amazing, great attendance and really good positive feedback from partners. We had executive symposium as well that started on Tuesday at the, after the keynote. And Again, what, and Nevis, what is executive symposium? Because for some people, they might not, not yeah, know what that is. So executive symposium brings together about 80 to 100 C-level um, of our customers and partners to really interact, share top of mind uh, topics, and really have an opportunity to network between themselves, but as well as with our Cisco executives. So it's a, it's a one day event, it's fantastic, it kicks off after keynote, and we had some really good positive feedback uh, this year. So I would say, come and join us, be part of something amazing, but also come and get inspired by all the innovation that is around us, right? Mm -hmm. For sure, thank you. And if I can add to that, actually, for me it's also a little bit FOMO, <laughs> yes. a fear of missing out. I think anyone who has a Cisco certification or working with Cisco products, let's say, or even considering to work with our products, let's say, should be here, here is like, it's a flagship event. All our product teams are here. You can talk to the people who built the products, the software, let's say. You can touch them, you can feel them. You can talk to so many people, you can learn here. And even after the event, you can get anything on demand uh, as well, let's say. But it happened here on the floor. I mean, humans are social animals. We should talk to each other. <laughs> you can do that here. Yeah, so if you're watching us, come and join us next year. For sure. Um, so I just, I just have one more question. And I want to go back to the impact that we have here as event and at this event and the legacy we leave behind, right? And with social impact, um, Gerd, I know we've talked about sustainability being super important. Yep. Um, how else are we making us 
positive impact here yeah. you know, locally in Amsterdam. I mean, each year actually we do a kind of a social project, right, to give something back to the community. So this year actually we work together with the city of Amsterdam and Rotterdam, let's say, and they have all kind of, yeah, abandoned bicycles, let's say, and the Netherlands is a bicycle right, country. Of so there are tons of abandoned bicycles. You have to look bicycles. five different ways to make sure that you <laughs> cross the road safely. Exactly. Uh -huh. So what we are doing here is actually, anyone actually can actually build a bike, or let's say, yeah, refurbish kind of a bike, and then we give that back to the community, to, let's say less privileged uh, children and families, to actually be able to go around the cities and we give them back to the city of Rotterdam. So uh, yeah, really nice project. Awesome, well thank you so much for joining me. Give us a bit of the behind the scenes and thank you for you and to all your teams for making this such an amazing event for all of us. Thank you, it's a pleasure. Thank, thank, pleasure. thank you for having us. Thank you, thanks so much for joining here. We'll be right back. Well, our thanks go out to Nieves and Gerd and their entire team for making Cisco Live 2024 in Amsterdam such an amazing event. As they said, there are so many great reasons for all of you to be here in the room with us and hopefully you will keep your eyes toward the future and whichever Cisco Live is closest to you, please come attend. We would love to have you with us. I want to focus a little bit in now on one of our phenomenal partners, NetApp. NetApp has been an incredible Cisco partner for years, especially around the FlexPod product, which I don't even know which year we're in, 12 years, 13 years. Think about the technologies that have stuck around that long where the demand continues to grow and grow. We have rethought that partnership again and again, and we've heard from everybody, don't stop, just keep growing and keep building. Every Cisco Live, we build a phenomenal custom network operation center here on the show floor. It's always one of the most popular spots. Everybody wants to get over to the NOC and see the demos, and Rob Boyd is out at the NOC right now with uh, Bobby Uman, NetApp's Senior Manager of FlexPod Solutions, and Joe Clark from Cisco. Rob, what do you see and what do you hear? out there. Well, I do have both those individuals with me. I'm just going to start with my old friend Joe, and I don't mean by old, he never looks any older. He's He's got kind of that effect where you just get younger every year I, I see you. I have the Dorian Gray painting in my office that ages, so I don't have to. Okay. We've been down that joke yeah. long time before, but it's funny how it keeps working. But Joe Clark, I've always come to you for learning more about Cisco in so many different domains, so it's fun to talk to you here at the NOC. Uh, so this is actually the visual spot of the NOC, but you guys are big about showing exactly what's happening, being very open and transparent. Technically, the NOC is in another part of the facility, but I wonder if you could explain how this works, what makes it so different, because it's very unique that Cisco goes to the trouble to build this network. Why would we do that? What's important to understand here? Well, what's important is our attendees. So our attendees, our customers, our partners, that's why we build this network. We need to offer them services. We need to put Cisco's best foot forward. And you're absolutely right. We are in Hall 7 in the network operation, the, the front of house facing network operations center. We have on these displays you see behind me, we are showing statistics about what's going on live, about what's going on in the network. For example, wireless channel. Yeah, let's utilization. do that actually. I'm going to pause you there. Let's have Steve go over. You tell him exactly which screen to go to and tell us what we're looking at. So here we have the wireless channel utilization, a heat map in a Grafana dashboard for our main WLC, our main wireless LAN controller. We've got a number of different controllers here because we have such critical parts of the wireless network. So for example, we have a dedicated set of controllers for Keynote. Down here, these are the statistics that we are looking at to monitor the live part of the core network, so core and data center. Uh, here you're seeing things like NAT translations. We had over 490,000 NAT translations today in terms of what our attendees are doing on the internet. To my left, and maybe your okay, right, we'll go a little bit further there. All right. we have uh, active statistics about the wireless clients that are connected to our network and what types of, of protocols, what types of frequencies they're using. So you can see most, well, you could have seen, most were uh, Wi-Fi uh, six, um, six, five gigahertz Wi-Fi six clients. Well, let me, ask you, let me ask you about that because sometimes we are literally monitoring and actually watching this because it goes into your planning for the next event because you see shifts as people upgrade their radios, Absolutely. that's going to make a difference on the network. Mm -hmm. And so you're in, so tell me again, what are you seeing? What kind of shifts this year? 
So right after COVID, we were surprised to see how much Wi-Fi 6 had been adopted. So the 5 gigahertz version, but Wi-Fi 6 as a standard had been adopted. What we are seeing, though, is Wi-Fi 6E, the 6 gigahertz, is, is making a stand. And people actually have clients that support it that may not be connecting to those networks yet. So we're encouraging people, take advantage of the new protocols, take advantage of the more bandwidth. Uh, and we're deploying those networks so that they can start to test that. Are we still supporting 2.4 and such here at all, or do we shut some of these off? I was just told today that the 2.4 spectrum in here is pretty noisy. So we try to turn off and we try to encourage people to turn off and not to bring 2.4 gigahertz. It's just way too noisy there. We want people on the more modern protocols. We want people on the five, hopefully get more people onto the six and the new security with things like WPA3. Well, and speaking of that too, you mentioned, are we still, are we IPv4 only or do we support IPv6 as well? Uh -huh. No, 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 we are of course IPv6. In fact, we're looking at what we can do next year around this, this concept of IPv6 mostly. So really encouraging people to take advantage of a pure IPv6 internet. Excellent, so let's go back over to the high level diagram here because I, I want you to explain how it all works together. Where's the redundancy? Why do we design the, why do we break out the data center like this? In fact, I'm going to come around here. Can I have the other mic actually? We're going to do this on the fly because I want to make sure I don't stand in front of the screen. This is going to become yours. Thank you remember how you. to use that, uh, right? With this, yeah. this end with the soft end, yeah. you speak into it. The other got end it, you hold. Yeah. Uh, just keep it up close. Walk us through what's important here. So this is our data center. This is the logical diagram of our data center. It is fully redundant. Um, so this represents the core network, our handoff to the core. Uh, we have two instances, one that's in what we call the main equipment room number one, that's our, our core one. It has two Nexus 9336 switches. That goes down to our compute, which we have the 93, uh, 6332 fabric interconnects, and we have a UCSB chassis. Those are running all of the show's services, okay. things like DNS, DHCP, Umbrella. We have uh, a SOC, a security operations center, where we're doing active pen testing. We're doing passive monitoring of traffic. Everything that we need to run the show, we have an instance there. But that's not good enough no. because, again, we've got five days to make the best impression with our customers. One hour of downtime in a five-day event, we're talking sevens. We're not even close to nines. Yep. So over here, you know, why build one when you can build two at twice the cost? We've got an exact... Spoken like a true Cisco engineer. I love we, it. We've, we've got an identical copy about five kilometers away on the rye grounds of our data center, too, which runs redundant instances of our services, but can also act as a uh, extension of capacity. Okay. Um, same thing. We've got the 9336s, we've got the fabric interconnects, and we've got the compute. Now, the thing that makes this so important, the thing that gives us that level of criticality and resilience that we need is the underlying storage. And this is where our partner NetApp comes in because they provide us a very redundant, very resilient metro cluster a set of two clusters that are active active in terms of their ability to maintain the storage so they provide us with the scale that we need and they provide us with that resiliency oh that's awesome and thank you for the segue and the setup there but before i go over to bobby to talk a little bit more about that in more detail just to make sure we all understand it might i go to cisco lives almost exclusively obviously there's other conferences that go on you do a lot of other conferences how unique is what we do here versus other even industry conferences is this normal to build out network and do this kind of thing? At this scale, no, and, and we're Cisco, so we, we have to come, we have to yeah. come big. We, ha we have to show our best foot, um, and we also have to be able to give the attendees what, the attendees want internet. I mean, look behind you, right yeah. here. This is showing the total oh, amount of traffic. Since this is Saturday? This is since Saturday, the amount of traffic wow. the attendees, our customers and partners and us, have put on the network. Last year, after COVID, the first event after COVID, we tipped out at 59 terabytes. We're not even at the last day, we're at 61.84. Oh, yeah. And look at this IPv6 to v4 ratio. Good we're point. getting almost to 50% of that v6 traffic. This is the reason we do what we do, because our customers, our partners, the demos that are going on, they demand the bandwidth, yeah. they demand internet, and we have to provide that. That's and, perfect. And, and the venues, the Rye is actually pretty good. We take over a lot of their Cisco APs, but some of the venues can't do that, and that's why we bring in the additional services, the additional capacity. Perfect. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to take your mic and hand it over to Bobby. Sure. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate your help. Here, Bobby, I'm going to have you take this. Just for a second, can we walk over here? This is funny to me because we've got, I'll have you stand on this side. So tell me what we're looking at here. This is a live video feed. Very exciting. Make sure we don't miss anything, but what are we seeing? So this is a Flexport setup. Again, this is 
you're seeing live from the data center. It is built with redundant components. Mm -hmm. And we've been doing this for the past 14 years, and the Cisco and NetApp relationship has created a business of more than $16 billion over these yeah. years. And thanks to our partners for making this happen, right? Again, this covers uh, workloads from VDI, database applications, AI, et cetera, by having components from both sides with options for compute, CPU, and GPU with the application-centric storage solution from NetApp. So yeah. to double down. Uh, yeah, please, tell me where to go. Let's put the best foot forward. We'll kick everybody out over here as we do this. Excuse us, live show going on. Thank so, you so much. So again, to get give that extra protection, we have a metro cluster set up, as okay. Joe was alluding to, right? Our goal is to give a secure, scalable, uh, reliable network, and FlexPod is supporting it, right, right. in the back, back end. You could ask why we have all these set up. Our goal is to give the continuity between events over these years by having this uh, set up for yeah. NOC. So that's why we bring all these systems, make sure it's been tested in staging, and uh, we put that into an event, something like that, so that we know that it works. That's Our goal cool. is to give an enterprise network system. The way I see is any application you run, the first thing you need to make or make sure is your network is reliable. That way, whether you run a database traffic or storage traffic or regular network traffic, it is being tested. Yeah. I have a little story to back this MetroCluster solution. We, we about, I need to wrap up here at this point. I apologize, because we're having to go back over. But Bobby, thank you so much. And right. thank you for the relationship. Right. Partnership is so important. Guys, this stuff is so critical. Everything here runs on it. And these guys have tested it and making it work. So I hope you enjoyed a little bit of the look behind the knock. Steve? Thank you so much, Rob. Our thanks to Bobby, to Joe, as well as always for the great partnership. We are going to run a replay right now of one of our favorite innovation talks that has happened this week here in Amsterdam. Larissa Horton and Jono Luke welcomed Manuel Sevilla, CTO of Capgemini Business Services, to talk about the benefits of customer experience and AI. Every business today, meaning your business, it's being benchmarked against the most recent experience that your customer just had. What that means for all of us is good enough, it's not good enough anymore. Times have changed. Customers are going to choose with their wallets, they're going to choose with their voices. Fortunately, we've got great advancements happening in AI, promising breakthroughs for agent efficiency and so much more. Let's hear all about it. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. Excited to talk to you guys about this quickly changing industry and everything that we're learning. So first off, customer experiences are changing. I've mentioned this a couple of times. If I told you 10 years ago that you would get comfortable getting into strangers' cars regularly, you would say I'm crazy. And yet we do this every day with Uber. And the world, in terms of our expectations of what a brand will do to serve us, how they will meet our needs, how will they serve us, is changing very quickly. This is creating a very new challenge and dilemma for IT departments everywhere. On one hand, everyone knows that user experience is really creating a change in brand perception, how people spend, where they're going to spend, where they're going to be loyal. At the same time, IT departments are not necessarily given bigger budgets to go and transform for the future. They need to run the business while transforming. Very frequently I hear this compared to flying a plane and changing the engine while it's in flight. How do I do that without creating damage or impact to my business? Very difficult challenge. It's one that we've actually been focusing on quite a bit as we've been building out our cloud strategy and as we've looked at the different customers that we are going to bring alongside us into this cloud. So speaking of the WebEx Contact Center and our customer experience, what have we built? Where are we going? How are we thinking about this? We've categorized this in three different ways of interacting with a customer. First off, prevent them from calling you or contacting you at all are proactive experiences. How do we use data to better understand when you should be reaching out, why you should be reaching out, and really meeting their need before they even come to you? Next is self-service. With the changes in mobile apps and how we're able to do a little bit more in a self-service fashion, 
We have a lot of brands that are looking at how do we create self-service experiences that are easy to use and that will really fulfill those customer needs so they don't have to call in, wait in a queue, and again, get a better experience. Last but not least, we know there is always going to be a need for a human agent to deal with a wide range of customer requests, whether it be due, the due to the industry, like healthcare or finance, where people are not exactly comfortable sharing that type of information with a virtual agent, but also as things are not able to be dealt with through a virtual agent, we need to make sure that you can hand it off to a human and address that customer concern to make sure we're closing out that customer challenge. As we look at all of these engagement models, it is happening across a wide range of channels, different types of places where people want to have that conversation, whether that be on social or means of communication like WhatsApp, how we talk to our friends, our family. That's where I want to go and meet the vendors that I want to speak to as well. All of this is wrapped with obviously AI. I'm sure a word you've been hearing very often this week. There's no shortage of AI also in the contact center or the customer experience space. And we've built the entire cloud experience on top of a common WebEx platform. This is the same platform that powers our meetings, our calling, our messaging, our conference rooms. We've taken all of the capabilities that we've invested in over the last couple of years and we've added that into our customer experience. So what have we built? Well, we've really reimagined how people work in this industry. And these are just two of the new experiences that we've brought to market. These are available today. Our brand new agent desktop. We've taken a look at what does an agent do when they're interacting with a customer? What pieces of information do they need at their fingertips so they can serve their customers better and faster? Next, we looked at the supervisor experience. What does a supervisor need to do in this new world? when you're managing a set of agents that are not only taking phone calls and people on queues, but they're interacting on things like social media. How do I manage all the different ways that communication is happening with my customers, with my team? So with that, we want to jump into an example. So what you see here is a virtual agent. On the left side is the workflow, and on the right side is what the customer is actually engaging with. In this particular case, the customer would like to book a service. So first you're seeing that we are jumping into a security flow. The security flow is making sure that the customer is who they say they are. So we're validating that we know who you are. We're then able to look you up in our system of record, like a CRM. I'm able to find your information and look at what was the last product that you ordered. Looks like it's the doorbell. Well, we know you want to book a service, so let's figure out what services do people commonly purchase after purchasing that doorbell. Well, it's installation service. Great. You're able to do your selection of the service, and next up, we go straight into scheduling. When would you like this service booked? With some of our natural language capabilities, you're able to see there, day after tomorrow, we're being able to be contextually relevant to that date, select a date, a time, and last but not least, we're going to go into making a payment for that to simplify that visit once they actually go and do that service. So you're going to see an integrated payment experience here as well, in this case using Apple Pay. When I talk to customers today about what just happened in this experience, very often they have three agents. The first agent is triaging that incoming call trying to figure out what does this customer want, how can I help them, getting their information, verifying them. The second agent is able to do the service sale and maybe the scheduling, because not all agents are trained to use every single backend system. The last agent is handling credit card information, because again, not every agent has been trained to handle credit card information. We had zero human agents in this case. And not only was it zero, it was actually a pleasant experience for many customers. When we interviewed our different customer bases, definitely certain generations said, I do not want to talk to a human being. I'd rather do it over text. So you're not able to meet new customers in the experiences that they want. All right, let's jump into our brand new agent desktop experience. Let's take a look. So here we have our brand new agent desktop. What you're seeing here on the right is the different channels that an agent can go and serve. So maybe they handle some phone calls, maybe some chats, uh, some emails, some social. They're able to respond and see all the different communications that they're engaging with across the customer base. Next, in the middle here, I'm able to see live analytics. 
how am I doing with all of the calls that I'm getting, with all the cues that I'm supporting relative to my team? Really helps an agent understand their performance, where they need to pay attention, and what improvements might need to be made. We have an incoming call coming in right here, new customer coming in, and as I go and accept that call, I'm able to see the entire history of what this customer has gone through. I can see if they started with a virtual agent, if they were handed off from another human agent. I'm able to understand all of the context so I don't start that call by repeating questions that are gonna be very annoying to that customer. So I get all the context, it looks like they're looking for a discount. Turns out, I'm not actually allowed to do that, so I'm gonna go look at the information a little bit more and then eventually bring this to my supervisor or to my group support team. So first off, I'm gonna look at the contact history. Is this a customer that calls every day, every week, every month? How often are they engaging with us as an end user? That's not all of the information though. I wanna make sure I understand how much do they buy from us. Eventually, we just wanna make sure you're improving customer lifetime value. The integration we have with backend systems allows you to see the actual orders, when they were processed, if they were delivered, what is the state of this customer. Looks like they've bought some products already, now they're a repeat customer and they want a discount. I'm gonna go and get some support. We have integrated our UCAS solution, so the ability to engage a supervisor or a support team directly into the agent desktop. You don't need to use another tool. So right from here, I can go in and look at the discounts approval space, make a request, send the information with that customer. That team can now go into the backend system and also take a look at what does this customer look like? They provide their approval, and just like that, I'm able to give it directly to the customer. What would this have looked like in a different experience? Well, first off, I'd probably put that customer on hold, and then I would swivel chair to a different set of tools that I have to get trained on so that I can contact back office, whether it's for approvals, whether it's for looking up their orders, so many different tools. The average contact center agent is engaging with roughly 40 tools for all of the different things they need to do. And right here, you've seen that streamlined so they can deliver that customer experience very quickly to the customer. So next up, we're gonna talk a little bit more about AI and have John Ola come and join us, who's leading our overall contact center experience. John Thank you, Larissa. Good morning, Amsterdam. As Larissa said, we are supercharging our contact center product with AI to help you deliver on your customer experience goals. Let's start with why Cisco? Most of the industry today is working on what you see on the left-hand side, large language models. Text, emails, transcripts, understanding documents. But that's just the beginning. We at Cisco have heritage many years, decades, of understanding real-time media, voice, and video. And that's why we're building what we call our RMM, real-time media models, a way to understand more than just the words. I am an expressive person, ask the folks that work with me. I move my hands a lot, I talk up, I talk down. If suddenly I'm just talking plain level, something could be wrong. There is richness of signal in that audio and video that will give that human agent or the machine, the virtual agent, a better understanding of how to handle Jono's needs when he calls in. That's an example of why Cisco. We've also spent a lot of time building what we call our AI codec. Thanks to the engineering work that's being done right now, we are able to use about 1 16th in some cases, the bandwidth of the next best codec. Meaning that your customers, no matter where they are, will be able to get their message through to the virtual agent, to the human agent, they can be heard. And why does that matter? Well, first of all, it's a better customer experience. You can hear me, you can hear what I need, even if my bandwidth is not great. But there's downstream effects as well. Clearer audio means better transcription, better summarization. When you have better transcription and better summarization, you can then feed these AI models and do better there, better learning, drive better action towards the customer's outcome. So what starts as a better customer experience fuels the machine to deliver better customer experience. That's an example of why you need the RMM, the real-time media and understanding as part of your system. Now, I, I just gave an example of audio clear audio. We all 
have had good and bad experiences. I'm not going to comment on the story I'm about to tell you. You can decide for yourself. Uh, rental cars. This happens to me a lot. I changed my flight or my flight was delayed. Whatever that is, I need to make sure the reservation's still there the next day. Um, I am one of those people. I don't like calling in. I will spend five minutes in my mobile app to find the web chat. I'll start chatting. I'll say, I need to let you know that my reservation will change because I'm coming tomorrow. I'm coming a day later. Please hold the car for me. 90% of the time, I end up having to call in. They'll say, could you please call in to this number? We can handle this real time. That's problem number one. When I call in, I have to wait. I am put in a queue for the next available agent. That's problem number two. And then when that agent picks up, hello, uh, could I get your phone number, please? Wait, wait, but I'm calling you from my phone. And then it's, how can I help you? You told me to call in, faux pas number three. These are the makings of a poor customer experience. The way we see it, you should never have to wait as a customer. You should never have to repeat yourself. And when you're talking with that brand or business, they should know you. That's your personal concierge. That is a good customer experience. You saw with Larissa earlier uh, the underpinnings of this system, what we call our real-time journey data service. It captures all of the interactions that happen and those transcriptions so I can better understand. That is the foundational element of a great personalized experience. That also powers a new generation of really great agent experiences. We support the human agent with features like conversation summaries. When I have to, if I have to, hand off to another human agent, don't make that next agent read seven minutes of transcript. Give them what they need, that understanding, and they can pick up and continue. You lessen that frustration because of that handoff. Second, as I'm going through that interaction, provide me the answers that best serve the customer. As we bring in that understanding of John O's sentiment, we can, even, we can even shape that answer to not just be the fact, but match it to his tone. If he's upset, be more, you know, be more apologetic. Right? Those are things that will make a better customer experience. Finally, once that interaction is done, automatically generate the wrap up. We know this. For every five minute interaction, the agent is probably spending about a minute in wrap up. That's not great efficiency. The more we can do to help that wrap up happen faster, the better off the business is, and we can move on to that next customer. By the way, agent burnout and churn is a real problem. Generating wrap up also means that you have a higher quality bar of that wrap up which then again fuels the machine of understanding so next time around you're able to do better for that customer. Goodness all around. This next one is something we're really excited about. It's coming out later this year. It's coaching highlights. So I talked about summarization and understanding. Our system can take a recording, an interaction, and break it into chapters based off of a topic. Then we overlay our understanding of that sentiment, which we can do best because we understand voice, video, and such, and provide the supervisor a very focused understanding of not just is this agent good or bad, that's too, it's too coarse grained, but what topics, what part of these interactions are going well or not, so that you can pinpoint some training, or perhaps this is not the right agent for this topic. Right? It's a new way to think about this, all done in real time. What I'd actually like to do next is invite Manuel Sevilla, who is the Chief Technology and Innovation Officer with Capgemini, to talk about your journey with Contact Center and Cisco. Good morning, Tano. Thank you, Manuel. Good morning, Please. everyone. Have a seat. Okay, so Manuel, we've talked about customer experience, contact center, and AI. Um, I'd love to maybe have you share with the audience first a bit about Capgemini and what you and your team do to support your customers. So as you may know, Capgemini is a huge company, very well known for consultancy and IT. <clears throat> I've been 20 years in Capgemini in many roles, but six years ago, I've joined an entity named Business Services. We deliver operational services for our customers. So we deliver finance and accounting, HR, customer interactions, and supply chain services to our customers, so it's daily operations. And of course, to do that, we need to work in a way that we're absolutely transparent with the customers, so that we are part of the customer team. So we use Cisco typically to have only one way to connect everyone independently of their Capgemini or from the customer's team. Okay, so it's a completely transparent and smooth way to deliver these services. So internally when they call or even when the customers or suppliers call us, they don't even know that we're outside. They're just called the company of our number, of the, the number for our company, 
and they're routed to us in a very transparent and smooth way. Great, and something you've taken on recently is migrating from an on-premises infrastructure into cloud for your contact center and calling. Could you talk so about that? It's an interesting topic because we are 25,000 people delivering that every day, okay? And the market of outsourcing has really changed years ago from now. <clears throat> years ago it was a cost play. How to be the cheapest one, and they were outsourcing to reduce the cost. Now they outsource to transform. The companies have understood that the opportunity to give that kind of operations to a company like us is the way for us to finally transform the way it's done. Which means we have to be not only cheap in the, in the service, but also innovative all the time. Being innovative means something very, thing, very simple. We have to work with our partners where R&D is spent. So that's why we decided five years ago to do a massive move to cloud operation. So that move to cloud went in three big steps. First one, adding more and more native SaaS partners in our business areas. Second one, it was all the telephony topic, and I will deep dive on that, of course. And third one, it's, it's a complete infra move, so that will decommission all of our infrastructure on premise to, to be fully on the cloud. Last year, we have ended the move to cloud of Cisco from our telephony to the contact center enterprise, so CC, on the cloud. We did it really for one key reason. CC was able to allow us to keep all of the features that we had before on the cloud without any impact on production. So we're not at all impacting the, the features. It's important to understand because we are working for more than 100 of customers, each of them with their own contracts. And if we are changing the feature, the way we deliver the functionalities, it could lead to infinite contract discussion with them. So we had to find a way to move without altering it. And we took the risk to go to CC, despite the fact we are the first global prime of CC. Because we deliver our customers everywhere in the world. We follow the sun. So we have customers in Asia, in Europe, in US. And we had to move it every, everywhere. So the move to cloud has not been easy at all. Not only because of that, but also because we came with very hard features. We have extended disaster recovery, high availability across the globe. OK? So it's interesting because we work with you in fine tuning the product. Yep to support customers like us with our level of expectation. Yep. That's extremely important. And honestly, it was a risky move, okay? Because we were sure that that move was not going to be as smooth as it has been. First of all, we took a partner, we work with Seven, who is very specialized in the, in the migration. It's important because our teams are not only capable to do the migration, but they were focused on business continuity. Mm -hmm. Very important. So we needed to have an expertise to do it. And we did it with about 12 waves in a year and a half to make it happen. These ways were not at all easy for two reasons. Technical reasons, we had to really change the way it was working, but also a topic that is more and more important today. Compliance, data regulation, data location, contractual aspect with the customers, etc. So we did a complete transformation problem with our customers. Every of our customers signed a document giving us the ability to use Cisco, but also Amazon, Azure, and Google, as a place to store data, as a place to process data, all the rules on data privacy, where data will be located, etc. And I have to give you a, a big feedback on this one. With all of the customers, it has been signed easily. Of course, some customers are always the ones who are asking a lot of details. You know that. Not all of the customers are the, are the, are the same. But we have been able to make it everywhere. So I don't know if it was just the COVID phase that happened or whatever, but the teams, especially ourselves, who were scared about that move, to, that move to cloud, today are very happy about it because our customers are even asking us, why you're not on the cloud <laughs> to our competitors? OK, so we're already doing it. And now we're moving to the next step. Yep. Because after we ended that wave, it was December last year. So you said it's very, very recent. Okay. After we did it, now we go to the next step, which is innovation. Now we're on the cloud, and you see a lot of things in this event, and you will keep seeing it. It's about using the marketplace on top of Cisco CC, using the innovations of Cisco, using all the generic web to now bring more value to our customers. Because I insist, our business moved from a cost business up to an outcome-based business. So how do we generate more value to our customers? 
and GenAI and all of this picture will be the key for that. So we're just at the beginning of a transformation wave. Yep. But we're very happy customer and partner of Cisco, of course. Absolutely. As you can see, big adventure. Absolutely, and I think just to, to reiterate, right, it is the velocity of the innovation that will now come, that's the benefit. Right, the fact that we as a platform have all these capabilities, we have a great partner ecosystem that bring pieces in, and then working with you on that transition as you move forward. Absolutely, and velocity is very important because imagine that we had not done the move to cloud so early. We would have at the same time to do the move to cloud to access all these technologies and the innovation at the same time. We would be dead. Absolutely. Now we can just focus on innovation and make it happen. So that's really the big trend that's happening. Great. Well, Manuel, thank you so much for sharing with the audience. Uh, hopefully, hopefully you got something out of that, and thank you for being a great customer and a partner for Cisco. Thanks, John. Yes. It's been a pleasure. Thank All you, the Manuel. Time. Thank Absolutely. You. Take care. All right, so Manuel described our journey together, right, Capgemini and Cisco. But that's not the only customer out there. In fact, we serve 3.6 million agents across our premises and cloud products, across 36,000 organi 36, organizations, lots of organizations. Uh, this is how we've learned. This is how we understand why and what matters to you as a business in delivering your customer experience. These three words come up over and over and over again when we talk to businesses. The flexibility, as Manuel just described, where are you on your journey? Right, journey to the cloud, journey in your customer experience, all these pieces. We will meet you where you are so you can meet your customers where they are. Some businesses are still heavily voice. Others are adopting digital. That's okay. The platform we have, the products we have, allow you to bring these capabilities incrementally online. Like we just said, it's a journey together. So meeting you where you are, that's the flexibility. Reliability, we recognize and understand that contact centers are the lifeblood of business. And so having that uptime is key. And then finally, continuity. Allowing your business to continue forward as we're bringing these new innovations to you. You adopt at your pace. These are critical characteristics. We get it, we understand. And that's how we're here to support you on your journey. That journey is also global. Most folks sitting right now probably can name at least five countries that your business interacts with customers in. We can help you on this. We can support your agents across 87 countries thanks to our seven data centers, the seventh coming online this year, meaning that no matter where your customers are, you're ready for them. And that flexibility, again, it starts with how. How do you want or need to deploy? We are the only vendor in industry that continues to support some of the most sensitive and critical workloads due to compliance and security with our on-premises product. If that's where you need to be, that's okay. We will support you and bring that innovation to you. But we also have our cloud architectures, WebEx Contact Center Enterprise, WebEx Contact Center, an architecture to meet every need. Then we can talk about adopting those capabilities, bringing that AI online to better support your customer, your agents, and your supervisors. That's our approach. Again, it's incremental. It builds on these, but it starts with flexibility for you and how you need to run your contact center. Now, changing tracks a little bit, I want to close on this. We believe that great customer experience is every single employee's responsibility. Not just the agents that pick up the phone, not just the supervisors that watch your agents, and not just the developers that might be building these integrations in those apps, every employee. And that's why we've introduced what we call our WebEx Customer Experience Essentials. Let me walk you through this slide. We'll start on the left-hand side. WebEx Exper Customer Experience Basic is included with our WebEx Suite. You've got calling, you've got those capabilities, a basic call center. We've always had on the right-hand side our standard and premium for true contact center agents and supervisors. But we recognize there's an emerging group of employees who need to participate in that customer engagement, but they're not a full-on agent or supervisor, and the simple voice multi-line may not be enough. They need customer context. They might need to engage across digital and voice. That's where Essentials fits in. This is for your back office employees or customer-facing teams that aren't necessarily in the contact center, but still contribute to that customer journey. That's why we brought Essentials in, to give you that flexibility so any employee can be customer obsessed. And because of that, we can meet you anywhere where you are on your journey towards this North Star of customer experience. And 
We're going to make that better with AI. Because AI is going to help your human agents do things faster and better. It's going to help your supervisors understand and run that contact center better. And it's going to power the next generation of virtual agents. And again, with Cisco, we have a heritage in real time media, in voice, and video. These are going to continue to be key for the high value, super stressful situations. And that's why we are the right partner for you as you move forward in your customer experience journey. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed this and learned some new things. Welcome back to the TV studio, everybody. So glad to have you with us here on the live stream, coming to you from the beautiful Rye in Amsterdam. We are ticking down the final hours of Cisco Live 2024. Unbelievable, it has been an amazing week, and I'm so glad that we have had all of you with us here on the broadcast. My name is Steve Moulter. I want to remind you, please keep reaching out to all of us on social media by using hashtag Cisco Live EMEA, whatever social media platform you prefer, that's fantastic. We are here with our social media team ready to respond to each and every one of you. As a reminder, if you have missed any of the fantastic content, the innovation talks, the keynotes, any of our executive interviews or our fantastic demos, no worries at all. You're going to find every one of them in the VOD library. Just go to CiscoLive.com. They're going to be waiting right there for you. At this point, we're going to move to the other side of the TV studio where Nish is hanging out with Adele Trombetta, our senior VP and GM of CX EMEA, the customer experience arm of CX Cisco, Nish, let's go ahead and head over your way. Thanks so much, Steve. Adele, you're here with us in the studio. How are you doing? Very well, and thank you for having me. Well, thank you so much for being here. Now, we started out the week by seeing you on the keynote stage, which is yes. a great job, by the way. Thank you. Very and now we're really lucky because we can bring you this intimate conversation and deep dive a little bit into CX. Um, so I want to start, I know we're going to talk about customer experience, also sustainability. So we heard you in your, in your keynote talk, you yes. talked about observability, automation, AI, and the role that it helps in customers achieving their own goals. So how is Cisco and you know, customer experience and our team going to help customers do that? That's the perfect way for me to close the, the week with you. Yes. <laughs> and um, yeah, great questions. First of all, I must say that really sustainability is top of mind for our customers, our partners, and all of us. And even today, this week at Cisco Live, it was all about sustainability in each yes. and every conversation. Yes. Now, having said that, it's even true that uh, our customers, they still do not have visibility into their sustainability performance. And uh, there is an interesting study that we have done recently with IDC, and we found out that only 18% really still a very relatively small number yes. of our uh, IT, of the MAIT department, they know where they are in terms of sustainability, they have defined a target, and also they are tracking that, the progress that they are doing. So we have uh, an important role to play here, as a Cisco and as a CX. And what do we do, to your point, actually we do three things. We help, first of all, our customer shaping their sustainability roadmap. So first thing we do, we assess where they are, we help them understanding their maturity, we align their sustainability and technology goals, and then we define an actionable roadmap. That's the first thing. The second is, okay, when you have defined the, what the roadmap is, let's make it in actions, and that is the scale. We help them bringing all the expertise, the experience, and the technology to help them and transform, to transform their, uh, um, their product, their services, and even their processes. And the last thing that we help them is the sustain. You know, you start, you implement, you scale, but then you have to continue improving yes. your sustainability journey. And that's what we do with the very simple, easy to use digital dashboards, where our customers can see real-time data, insight, and recommendations too. Amazing, and I know you know CX has a very wide, a broad portfolio. We have so many different services on offer. What are some of the outcomes that you are looking to drive in EMEA with our customers with CX? So first, thank you because for us it's all about outcomes. Yes, that's exactly what we want to do. We want to help our customers achieve their business outcomes. Yes, they need to have the best return from the investment that they do in our technology, in our amazing technology. And look, sustainability is one of the many outcomes we can help our customer to deliver. Recently, we have launched Lifecycle Services, that is a 
easier and more flexible way to help our customers. And sustainability is one of the 11 outcomes that we can help them deliver into. If they need to reduce their costs or enhance their security uh, posture or even improve their compliance or any of the other outcomes, we can help them. What we do is first we define with them, we align on their priorities, then we help them into the definition of which are the key PIs that better represent their priorities, right. and then we bring in the expert to make sure that they get exactly the outcomes they are looking for. I mean, that's great when you mentioned only 18% of companies know really where, where they're going yes. with sustainability, to have that helping hand from Cisco, exactly. to have that customization, those experts, and the yes. access to that level of expertise is, is really exactly amazing. Right. Exactly so, right. So what's next, and how can our partners help in serving our customers best? <laughs> what's next? That's a, that's a that's big a, question. That's a big one, <laughs> because honestly, if you ask me, I think that next is really, the limit is the sky. Be yeah. Why? Because of the power of our technology. If you think about the other big topic of the week, that is artificial intelligence. We've, we've mentioned that a few times I, I, here. I'm, I'm, pretty <laughs> sure, I'm pretty sure about that. But if you bring AI plus the power of the full stack of observability and the power of the security and the automation, you bring all of that into the solutions for our customer and into even context of sustainability, really what we can do is to allow our customers to have real-time visibility into their uh, sustainability or their uh, carbon footprint, their energy consumption, and optimize all of that and make sure that they continue to have fantastic business performance, improved business performance, and at the same time, contributed to the sustainability journey. Awesome. Now, Adele, this uh, week... At... Sorry if I interrupt oh. you because you asked me about partners. Oh, please. Absolutely right. I, I forgot course. about that. Yes, please. And where partners can help us is they can complement our offerings. Think about that. We have uh, recently launched and signed an MOU and, uh, um, with uh, Schneider. Why? Because talking about technology, there is now we, are, we have the OT and the IT that are converging yes. and the power that, that that can bring when it comes to sustainability. So to answer to your question, we will complement our offerings to make sure that we better serve our customers. Awesome, and I actually had the opportunity to interview Rodney Clark earlier this oh. week as well, so he was talking oh, a little bit about the value that our partners can bring, obviously in service of our customers together with Cisco, so I'm sure he's going to be very pleased yes, to hear you say much. that. Um, so the final question I have for you is this week you talked a bit about the CX customer heroes oh. and one of the things that we love to do here at Cisco Live is celebrate yes. the, the Cisco Live community but also people who are doing amazing things. Yes. Tell us a bit about what that award is and I know we're going to come back shortly and hear more about that in a oh, real, yes. life, oh, real yes. life story oh, yes. but tell us what the award is. You know what is? Is the best part of Cisco Live <laughs> and we wait one year to have and to celebrate our, our customers because as I said on the keynote, they are really the change makers. Yes. They are the ones that prove the value of our technology. And with them, we can really impact, make an impact, make an impact on, on, on our future, on our, on our people, on our life. And uh, they are, uh, we celebrate seven of them, and very soon we will talk with one of them that is about uh, sustainability. But what really matters is that we, they inspire us. They, because we see what we can do and how much we can achieve and every year we raise the bar and we try to do even better. Amazing, I'm so excited to be joined by one of those customer yes, heroes. Amazing. Thank you so much. Well, we're Thank gonna we're gonna come back to you, Adele, but first, Steve, back over to you. Thank you so much, Nish, and we'll look forward to come back and, uh, coming back over to you and Adele in just a moment. So, I'm here in studio now with Pete Davis, Director of CX Global Partner Success, and with John Christensen, Global Offerings Manager for IBM. Gentlemen, welcome. I'm so glad that both of you are with us today. Thank you. Likewise, thank this you. This is a great partnership. This is a long-term partnership and a powerful partnership between uh, yep. these two organizations. It's been so valuable, I know, for both of us. Um, First thing I want to ask, partnership, Pete, it's really the backbone of CX and what it is that we do. How has that partnership focus really materialized uh, specifically in our work with IBM, one of our favored best and long-term partners? Well, I, you know, I think for us at Cisco, um, we are a partner-led company, we always have been, and we always will be. And our relationship with IBM allows us to be able to blend the, the best of what we can bring to our customers. So what we see is, we see the opportunity to be able to take our business and start to focus on material growth 
and really enhancing how we're serving our customers and getting them through to being able to fully enjoy everything that Cisco and IBM have to offer. I love that. Before we even dive in further, John, I want to come to you and sort of ask the, the why Cisco question, right? IBM has a lot of options out there in the yeah. field. Why Cisco? It's a no-brainer. Obviously, Cisco is the 800-pound gorilla in the networking market. And for us, it really goes back to our history, <coughs> right? So back in 1999, right, we got out of the networking business. We sold all our patents around Token Ring to <laughs> Cisco. And we were all in at that point in our strategic partnership with, with Cisco. So, you know, we've all evolved big time over the 25 years and we keep seeing so much more opportunity as Cisco evolves and gets into more markets we have an opportunity to grow with Cisco. Absolutely, and we love to hear that, we really do, and we value it so much. Um, we put a huge emphasis on feedback, right, from our partners, from our customers. How has CX demonstrated listening to what our partners have to say, what they want from us, what they demand from us? How do we respond? Well, first and foremost, we want to make it clear that at Cisco, feedback is the breakfast of champions. Yes, indeed. And we use that feedback to be able to influence what we develop, our programs, our offers, and our go-to-market. So uh, really it's about the partnership and using that feedback to co-create the best solutions for our customers. Mm -hmm. So ultimately everything comes to the closed loop of being able to get the customer exactly what they need and our partnership facilitates that. And when you think about a venerable brand like IBM, I mean, it's hard to compare IBM to a lot of other brands. You've been around a very, very long time. I think responsiveness to the market, to the demands, not only the technical community, but of the user community is really what defines IBM. Yep. It's been a very agile organization, right? Yep. So same thing, I assume feedback, very powerful for you as well. Ab absolutely, and you know, it's great to work with Cisco because what we have found particular as this CX engagement, is that the Cisco executive engaged our executives at the top of the house. So we, we had the right start, and we did it across the different lines of business that were critical for success with Cisco. So it included delivery, solution design, sales of course, and offerings. So when you get that collaboration and that partnership and, and the feedback, it goes both ways and it's trusted and it makes all the difference in the world, it helps us accelerate. Absolutely. I'm going to do a little uh, shameless marketing plug right now and tie it over to you, all right? So, the theme of the show, let's go. You are one of the architects of technology lifecycle services at IBM. I'm going to put those two things together. Is TLS ready to go as we stand here today? Absolutely, we're, we're all in and uh, you know, as we like to say, all gas, no brakes. <laughs> so we just launched our Health Check on Cisco offering last week, and we're coming out of the shoot with two new offers around your SD-WAN, your Viptela offer, coming up here on February 20th. So we've really been concentrating on really getting the relevant offers to market faster. And the CX engagement model that I spoke about before has really helped us engage the different lines of business that all need to be working together. So when we launch, we're ready and all in. Absolutely, and Pete, what about from the Cisco perspective? I mean, we say let's go all the time, are we? Are we ready to? We are so ready, Yeah. and I, I think what we see in IBM is a partner that through their commitment and through their capability has grown faster than any other partner in the CX family and is now positioned to be able to help us grow together in a profitable way so that we can benefit our customers. So we're going to go hard and we're going to go fast and we're excited to do that with IBM. Which brings us to the last thing that I want the three of us to talk about and that is not just really future vision necessarily, it's current vision, but when we talk to our customers, they, they need to be intrigued by what we do. They need to be inspired and excited about what comes next. So let's talk about it. What steps do they take to get underway with what this partnership can offer to them? So reach out to IBM. Obviously we have a huge global sales organization. You can certainly get to people that care, your local account manager right off of IBM.com. So we see the market together. So much of what we're doing in terms of growth initiatives and capturing market demand right now are on the same topics. It's AI, it's sustainability, right? These, these are, you said security, right? So these are all key areas of, of growth and the market demands that we respond to this. 
So we're doing this together and we're doing it, quite frankly, more effective than we ever have before. And again, I think that's based on the partnership, right Pete? You bet, and if you're in the Cisco family and you need help with understanding how to engage with IBM, call me, email me, WebEx me, get a hold of me and let me help you connect with IBM and take full advantage of the IBM solutions with TLS. You can't ask for a better offer than that. We are a human first, a people first organization and that means reach out to the people who actually know what's what, right? Um, Pete, John, such a pleasure to have you in here with us and John, thank you again for this amazing partnership. We really do appreciate it. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Pete. Pete, thanks thank man. You. Thank you. Well done for the work that you do. All right. We are going to be coming back in just a few minutes with Anish and Adele and one of the fantastic CX award winners. Remember, social media is out there at all times. Hashtag Cisco Live EMEA. We are going to head back across the way into the other half of our Cisco TV studio to Nish and Adele. Back to you guys. Thanks so much, Steve. Yes, you had Steve. If you're having a great time at the event, whether you're at home, you're watching it from anywhere across the world, remember to use hashtag Cisco Live and at Cisco Live. We love to hear the experience that you're having, so be sure to share that with us and whatever your highlights are and any ideas that you have for next year's event. So as you said, I'm here joined back by Adele. Adele, thank you so much for staying with us this time. So happy to have you. And we're also joined by Iman now. So Iman, how are you doing? Good, thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. So, Iman, you're a winner of the CX Customer Hero Award. Firstly, congratulations. That's Thank really exciting much. news. I want to come to you, Adele, and I yes. would love to understand, um, you know, what was it about this story with, you know, um, Expo City Dubai? What made them an amazing winner for this award? Look, I must say that uh, I'm really honored to be working with the Expo City Dubai that was first uh, Expo 2020 Dubai since few years. And uh, with the man, at the time it was just desert. There was right. nothing, and we really built everything from scratch. And the reason why they have won this award is because, thanks to the flexibility of our technology, we were able to reuse almost 90% of the infrastructure and data center that we at that time created for the Expo 2020 Dubai. And now we had recently uh, Dubai hosted the COP28, and it's the first. COP ever, that instead of starting from scratch and creating a new data center to serve the event, we were able to reuse what we did, and with that we helped the, our planet too. Awesome, Adela, I want to stick with you and ask you one more question, because some people might not necessarily know what the award is about, so what is the kind of criteria, what makes a good winner? Uh, the good winner is the one that has been uh, more innovative and it's been even the ones that has created more impact, impact in this case on the sustainability on our planet. Awesome. Um, now in a second I'm, I'm going to come to you, man. but obviously can you tell us a bit more about Expo City Dubai? Uh, I'm going to come to you in a second, but I would love to hear from the Cisco perspective, what made them a really great you know, customer to be working with a great project? The, the thing that really differentiates Expo 2020 and now Expo City, they are forward looking, forward thinking. They are really innovative. They want to bring and try the new technology, the innovation. They want to real they are brave. And we want to help them yes. succeeding. So that's <laughs> what sure. really makes us exciting working with them. And of course we we know that with them we really can make as I told you before a great impact. Awesome. Now Imal I definitely want to come and hear your perspectives on, on the side of the story. Why has sustainability been a priority for you and what are the sustainability goals that you're looking to achieve? So sustainability has been the cornerstone of our philosophy at Expo City and it was one of the guiding themes for Expo 2020. And this is symbolized in our Terra Pavilion, which is an LED platinum certified structure. Uh, it's a testament to our sustainability vision, achieving net zero in energy, water, through its unique, innovative design, including 120 meter wide canopy and 18 energy trees that produce four megawatt of energy per year. And when it comes to water consumption as well, yes. we're in a quest to reduce, reuse, and also protect. So in 2019 alone, we've achieved more than 50% of water reduction demand in our buildings, which is equivalent to 41 uh, swimming pool, uh, Olympic swimming pool wow. uh, size. 
That's a lot. That, yeah, that is a lot, <laughs> exactly. A really lot. And I mean, having an event with such a high profile and being able to make such a positive impact is, exactly. is really important um, in, a way to, in a way to do that responsibly, yes. right? In the same way we try and do in that. In a way being responsible. Absolutely. Responsible. True, true. Absolutely. So how did CX services help you achieve some of those sustainability goals? I know, you know, you're laughing yeah, you, you probably have a really <laughs> close relationship with each other, right? But how have you been working with Cisco CX? So working with Cisco CX has been essential. I mean, as Adeli said, our relationship goes back in years in 2016, 17. And as I always say in my video as well, they're a part of Expo's family. So back in that time when we were planning and designing, we had to consider the legacy. Right. So we had to consider the legacy of Expo site, which is now Expo City. So what did that mean at that time? The way we design the network infrastructure and the technology investment that we made should give us the flexibility, should be cost effective, and should be also central operation or smooth operation, we might call it. All of this is important for us, gives us the flexibility to reuse the network infrastructure to host any mega event with their unique requirement, similar of us hosting COP28. Amazing. And what really, if I may yes. add, I think that the most important thing is that we were really, we felt that we were, and we are, transformational partner of uh, Expo City, not only just a customer. We don't consider, I mean, we, the relationship that we had is, we, we still have with Cisco is not a typical um, customer yes. relationship. It's, it's uh, um, a relationship it's that was, partnership that was built over the re years uh, across when, as you mentioned at Delhi yes. earlier, it was a desert. Yes. We yes. built everything together. together. From the ground up, and yes. yeah. I mean, literally, like, literally, you're talking about literally, literally building from exactly the ground up. Right. Awesome. So let's talk a bit about the future, and you know, how are you going to continue to partner with CX? What are your plans? I'm sure you have big dreams. Where do you want to go next with the events? So Expo City Dubai is human-centric cities of the future. So we're focusing on pushing the boundaries of what's possible between the intersection of technology and sustainability. We're working on a very exciting project with Cisco yes. and their partner Schneider on the data center decarbonization project. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me here in the studio. It sounds like the, the partnership is like a rock star partnership. I'm yes. really sensing the excitement, yes. the love that we have within the two organizations and also the cultural flair of innovation, doing great in the, you know, great in the world and sustainability as well. Anything final you, you want to add before we close? You first. I think um, being here in Cisco Life showed us different opportunities that we were working on. The uh, data center is one initiative, but I'm sure through the workshops and the meetings, we came up with a lot of great ideas. Maybe by the next Expo Life, we were going to be announcing another project. Awesome, well. great. And I we tell just it. want to continue to inspire Expo City and all the rest of our customers. That's what Cisco Live was all about, right? Yes. Inspiring and taking those next steps. Well, thank you so much for joining me thank both here in the yeah. studio. Steve, we're going to head back to you. Thank you so much, Nish. I appreciate it. Thank you to Adele and congratulations really to all of the CX Hero Award winners. Remarkable organization. For those of you not currently taking advantage of Cisco CX, this is the customer experience arm of Cisco. And what does that actually mean for you? It means that you've made the investment in Cisco let CX help you to maximize that investment. What can you do with what you already have? How can we help you and support you to really make the most out of what it is that you do in partnership with Cisco? That's what we're here for. That's what CX is all about. That's why I love this part of the organization so much. We're going to take a very quick break. Don't go anywhere. I will see you in just a moment. Well, not that I ever want to go anywhere away from CX, but we're just going to take a moment to do that. And we're going to talk DevNet here for a few minutes. And the DevNet zone is somewhere right like back over there on that side behind us here in the TV studio. DevNet is Cisco's developer program. We're helping developers and IT professionals who want to write applications, develop integrations with Cisco products, platforms, APIs. This includes a variety of different Cisco products and software defined networking and security and cloud and data center and IT. IoT and collaboration, open source software development. It's so exciting and Rob is over in the DevNet zone right now. Hello, my friend. Hello, Steve, thank you so much. Yes, I am in the DevNet zone. I'll tell you one of the problems with trying to figure out where to go in the DevNet zone, and I mean this, I don't mean this in a negative way. Mel's here, I'll introduce him in just a second, but it's the fact that there's so much going on. It's like, well, what do you mean? Where am I going to meet you in DevNet? It didn't used to be that way. DevNet's grown quite a bit. Mel, you're a 25-year Cisco veteran. Three yep. years now, you're a developer advocate yep. for DevNet. 
but this is a notable year for you guys. You've come a long way. Can you tell us a little bit about how DevNet's evolved? Yeah, you know, uh, start off as like networkers before, and then now, here we are at the 10 year anniversary. Wow. So we've grown, uh, it has just increased in, in, in importance for a lot of developers out there. And, and we're just seeing that over and over again with the comments that we get yeah. from our developer uh, community, yeah. Well, it's interesting, because I remember 10 years ago when you guys were, um, uh, starting this out, and, and you had craft beers and all kinds of things. I really enjoyed. Make sure you keep the microphone up here. When you Got it. Yeah, okay. Just getting the signals. But um, yeah. But it was it was the um, kind of selling people on the importance of what DevNet represented, and how to many it was obvious that Cisco needed to go this way. To others, it wasn't as obvious. But you guys continue to show how this is Cisco's future, and the growth you've shown really feels like it's part of it. What kind of things are you guys focused on? What's most important that's happening here right now? So today I think a lot of the importance has shifted over to things like OTEL, technology, open telemetry. That's open short for open telemetry, okay. yeah. So observing the, net, uh, the uh, network, observing your, your overall health of, of just the way things are running in your network, that's all done programmatically today. Yeah. And so things like the APIs and so forth are increasingly important. So, and, and so, and then we're seeing a growth in that area, and we're seeing that in our feedback, we're seeing in the attendance, the questions that we're getting. Yeah. Uh, for example, I was just working over there in the user experience area, and we're gathering all kinds of construction, uh, constructive feedback, rather. That's good, uh, too. And so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and what, what's the focus area? Because it's, I, I get the feeling that you guys are not just educating people who already understand this, you're not just teaching them about how Cisco does it. There's a lot of industry knowledge, and there's a lot of kind of raising all ships with knowledge so that we have more people in the market with a skill set that's becoming increasingly important for all of us. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And, you, and you hit the nail on the head there because it's not just one thing. We're, we have folks, as, as you see in the user experience area, maybe we could just kind of pan over in that. It's on the other side this over is here. The, is that white desk over there? Yeah, to that the right white of the desk. Lightning talk side? Yeah, you okay. bet. And so over there, what you'll find is uh, we'll put little dots on the, the, the technologies that a lot of our developers are using and yeah. giving us feedback on. And so. I think for me it's really interesting because so you're like you're building saying, a heat map kind of yeah, thing. Kind yeah, kind of sort of, yeah. Okay. Um, granted, it's, a, it's an analog one, you yeah, know, yeah, kind yeah, of with stickers but, and everything. But um, the principle's perfect. Exactly, yeah. And so what you're seeing is that developers are showing us that it's all these different technologies like you were saying. And sometimes yeah. they're open source, uh, sometimes it's just specifically with networking, sometimes it's uh, specific to container orchestration or what have you, and it's this massive mix of uh, technologies that we're, we're helping uh, well, one of the things you guys brought with. here that I really appreciated was I've always loved, you know, Cisco to me, when I think about it personally, it's always about always being surrounded by people smarter than yourself. And then, but, but it's such a way that these are people that help you grow because we all kind of push each other or set different examples. And I, for me anyway, my experience is, I feel like has always been healthy. Your focus on education, even when you guys first started at Cisco Live, I feel like has been very present. Uh, and I'm amazed that how many theaters you guys operate at any given moment. What are you guys, what are you covering in these theaters and does it, is it a huge range of skill levels? Are people self-selecting? Is it different than what you do in a breakout? What's happening here versus maybe breakout sessions? Yeah, so I, I think in ours what we have is, over here we have a theater. Okay. And the theater we're looking for more like thought leadership. Okay. And, and, and top very stuff. high, big picture stuff, exactly. So, and then you'll have, as you go over on this other side of the theater, oh, we'll have, the yeah, okay. yeah, we'll have workshops and that's where you get the hands on. 45 minutes, super yeah. intensive, and then you have all like varying degrees of difficulty. So you'll have the basic intro classes, you'll have something that's intermediate, and certainly things that are a little bit more advanced. Um, and it's interesting because sometimes you'll see that people are just standing, even yeah, though it's- Just on the edges. Yeah, they're staying and on the edges. on headphones too, but right. yeah, that, that one didn't know. Yeah. And, and they're, just, they're just taking whatever they can they're just- absorbing. They can absorb, and they'll just, okay, I can't make the- the, uh, the workshop, tribe, I, you know, That's yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you can just see that the enthusiasm and yeah. the willingness to learn new things is just something well, I feel that, like for that anybody that's looking to, to, to continue to develop skill sets that are going to serve them for the long time, whether it's Cisco or not, because everything you guys cover is very applicable in all areas. It seems very industry, not you know, APIs. That's not a Cisco thing, but um, but when it comes to this, um, do you guys have learning tracks? How hard is it to say if someone comes in? I remember going on your website and taking some of the initial tests oh, yeah? and going through and then, it, and then it would kind of tell me a learning path to go through and it was all free of charge. I assume you guys still have these resources available? We do and they're on uh, developer.cisco.com oh, and you're going to find that. learning labs, sandboxes. Uh, certainly if you join us here at Cisco Live, uh, yeah. you're going to have participants not only from our team that's providing that, but we provide that infrastructure, if you will, here so that other uh, 
experts from within the company yeah. can share their knowledge, and you just learn tons. And when you're done there, you can join us on developer.cisco.com, and that's yeah, where you're going to find all the community. Yeah, ongoing community that pro provides all kinds of, like you pointed out, free resources, yeah. which I think is uh, massively valuable. And I, I can only say that because I've I've had people show up and just thank us. Not me, I mean, just to thank <laughs> yeah. other people just randomly saying, well, you know what, commitment. you took my career in a whole other direction. Yeah. That, well, and it's a language. You're learning how to speak a language that becomes so, if, if I understand, you know, route switch and that type of thing, I yeah. can't get away without understanding, well, how are we going to interact and what are, the, what are the ways in which we're going to standardize on that communication? And now that we're containerizing, we've got open telemetry and everything else, it becomes all that much more important. Uh, final point, what's most yes. important to remember here uh, about DevNet? What do you want to lead people with? Well, I think it's the importance the importance of the APIs, the okay. importance of programmability. I think early on we were kind of looking around those corners mm -hmm. and pitching it, if you will, yeah. but here we are. Yeah. And great things have been done with it, and in today's world, as you're seeing sort of almost like this Lego IT sort of mentality of bringing components together outside of your domain, yeah. coupled with your domain, I mean, those those APIs and, and, and that that set of skills yeah. is incredibly important, and I'm just so glad that we get to serve the community in that way. Well, I love it, and I, it, it comes across like that. You guys are serving a community, you're feeding the community, and I like the way that goes. It's cross is all be used. You yeah. guys have pushed into Cisco to get better at as a company about doing that. Keep up the good work. Thank you for Thank taking you so the time. Much. I think I it took you away from a Thank customer. You. Absolutely. But guys, that's it for the DevNet Zone for now anyway. We may be back later. Who knows? Steve, we'll go back to you. I hope you will be back, Rob. I always love the work that DevNet is doing. Always such a popular spot here at Cisco Live as well. Uh, remarkable job. Please thank the team for me. So now that we are back in the TV studio, we get to talk legal stuff. I've got Harvey Jang with me, Chief Privacy Officer with us at Cisco. Harvey, thank you for uh, coming in out of your crazy space back over there. You've had a lot of sessions. I'm glad you were able to join us here on the set. Yeah, thanks for having me. You get, and yeah, as you said, we don't get to talk legal stuff <laughs> all that often. Right. Um, what I want to talk with you today is about something that's so cool. It was last month's Cisco uh, 2024 Privacy Benchmark Study. For those of right. you that didn't see it, this is our annual review of key privacy issues and their impact on business. This year was really interesting interesting, this particular survey, right? Uh, wow. Most organizations, they're limiting their use of Gen AI rather than expanding it because they're concerned about data, right. uh, data privacy and security issues. 27% say they've banned Gen, uh, Gen AI altogether, at least temporarily. Right. <laughs> Give us your perspectives here, what's going on? Yeah, yeah, so this was our seventh year in putting the, out this uh, privacy benchmark study where we survey thousands of IT professionals around the world across 12 different geographies to get their take and sentiment on hot topics and trends in privacy. And some of the things that stood out was, again, yes, a lot of people are afraid uh, and cautiously embracing this new technology of AI, but some of the other things that stood out is really embracing privacy as a business imperative, which led to our title of privacy as an enabler of customer trust. So this year, some of the findings just really stood out that what we've been talking about for years, like right. privacy goes far beyond a you know, check the box compliance exercise. And so extending beyond that, like 94% of companies said they wouldn't buy from vendors that they didn't trust to protect their data. And so it just started shifting into something that you really have to pay attention to from a customer and market and business perspective more than check the box compliance. And that's something that we've talked about from the very beginning of our privacy program eight years ago. Right, right, right. I mean, we've been in this market, Cisco has been in AI for many, many years. Everybody right. thinks this is a new concept. It's not. The way we're talking about it is new, but we've been yeah. around for 10 years with AI. We see it in tons of our products. I always say that when we're trying to tell a story to people, AI is the perfect example, we have to remember the hierarchy of the way humans hear information. They hear as people first, right. consumers second, corporations third. We can't <laughs> go in the opposite direction, right? right? And that's yeah. why I think even from a company level, we say there's a lot of potential opportunity and benefit for AI, but right. if the person first is afraid of it, well guess what, we've got to crack that code, right? Right, 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 so you do have to, Find a way to harness the power of AI and the opportunity that's out there, but at the same time, make sure that you're cognizant of the risks and approach it with a bit of humility, right? There's so much that we don't know we don't know yet, right? And so much that we have to work through and unpack and really have to set that governance structure up. So you start paying attention to what those risks and opportunities are and set your strategy for your organization. It's a great way to put it, it's a great way to put it. Um, let's go with another statistic that came out of the survey. 91% yep. of businesses recognize that they have to do more now 
as you said, to reassure their customers your data right. is being used for its intended and legitimate purposes when it comes to AI. Right. How do we get them that confidence that they need? Yeah, so that is a challenge, but building on a foundation of privacy, because these are some of the things that we've done for years, right? Looking at understanding the data and really driving those concepts of transparency, fairness, and accountability. And what we're seeing in AI is really that transparency and explainability is what customers are asking for, and thankfully business are recognizing they need to do, and regulators are going to start demanding it very soon with a bunch of AI-related legislation that's in the works, really calling for that transparency. People need to know when AI AI or generative AI has created the content. People need to know when AI is making the decisions that are going to impact your life. And so transparency has been pushed up to the forefront here as one way to gauge fairness. In a sense that fairness is so many different definitions and <laughs> I think there's studies that talked about 21 different algorithmic definitions of fairness sure. and so what is actually fair. So we start with transparency. Disclose it and the public will tell you if what you're doing is fair. It's so subjective. Do you right. see 2024 as a tipping point or a as a point where we start to change the nature of the conversation or do you think this is a longer play? It's much longer, but I hope the conversation is just beginning uh, and we're beginning to pay attention. I mean, people talk about uh, AI as the fourth industrial revolution or, or uh, you know, the first uh, industrial revolution for knowledge workers was another phrase I heard in this conference today. You remember what Oliver said during yeah, the opening right. keynote. He said it's, the mo it's more important than the invention of fire. I don't right. know that I'm going to go that far, but... <laughs> but it's saying. important in the sense that if you look at what happened in the prior industrial revolutions, people weren't paying attention to the harms that were emanating from that. And we're still discovering, right? And we're, sustainability is a hot topic. We're still going through the impacts of the prior industrial revolutions. So let's try to pay attention and get ahead and proactively try to mitigate and prevent the harms coming from this new technology. It's a great way to put it. Um, here at Cisco, we have been researching privacy for a very long time yes. at this point. What do you think are some of the key trends that you personally have seen emerge? Maybe some of the highlights of the research that sort of point up those trends? Yeah, yeah, so it's some of the trends that we are seeing that really stood out is we're seeing, right, the increase in spend. Uh, related to privacy, but thankfully people are still seeing a very positive return on investment. And so over 95%, despite the increased spend, are seeing a positive return. And their, the return it was averaging 160%. I think we would all love that level of return on any <laughs> investment that we put out there today, but people are still seeing the business benefits of privacy. And we actually gave a talk on that at the IT leadership uh, sessions about the po positive business benefits to privacy programs and investing in privacy. Really just the first step is understanding your data. If you have to first yeah. figure out what's personal data, what's sensitive personal data, then you start understanding, classifying, segmenting, and then when you understand your data, you can better harness the value and take advantage of the opportunities that the data presents. And a lot of that data that potentially causes risk, frankly, is already in the system. Uh, people already entered it some time ago, <laughs> right. not realizing that, okay, we may yeah. have a little uh, concern on our hands. I want to yeah. go to your specific role. Yeah. So as Cisco's chief privacy officer, right. how do you go about navigating that changing intersection oh, wow. between AI and privacy? It's a delicate dance, yeah, right? Yeah, it is a delicate dance, and privacy started the foundation, foundational to our responsible AI program, because AI isn't new to privacy. I think uh, the GDPR that was passed here in Europe in 2016 has Article 22 that talks about automated decision making and working through the risks to a person when AI is being used. But well before that, the 95 Directive on Privacy <laughs> also talked about ADM and automated decision making. And even the French privacy laws in the 70s were worried about AI, I guess whatever AI was around whatever in the 70s, but they point. were very concerned about that. And so we're starting to pay attention to, to how decisions are made and requiring that a human is in the loop, right? Mm -hmm. And so those types of things. And as we looked at privacy and AI at Cisco, recognize that yes, privacy is a big issue. We're a critical stakeholder but the risks and opportunities go far beyond privacy, right? right? Risks to intellectual property that are unanswered questions of who owns uh, the rights to the data uh, and was the data ethically and legally sourced? Uh, that's a big question that's floating out there, both from a privacy perspective and a copyright perspective. And so there's all those other aspects of you know, human rights, sustainability, all these other components that AI is going to impact. And so at Cisco, although we use privacy as a foundation and using the tools and frameworks we set up, we brought in 
another group <laughs> to look after this. We, and we're recognizing that it has to be multidisciplinary. You have to look at it at all different angles. And so we have a responsible AI committee uh, that's cross-functional, led by our engineering team, and looking at both the promise and strategy and opportunities of AI and the risks and how are we going to deal with them. And just surfacing it first and so we can have some thoughtful discussions on what the right approach is. And so it's still evolving uh, at this stage. I think it's so exciting and what I love is we're personalizing it now, yes. right? Uh, so Jonathan Davidson the other day, he yeah. said, let AI do the unimportant stuff so humans right. can do the important stuff. Um, yeah. This is a way I think that we start to pull back from that fear. Let yeah. AI cover the things that people don't necessarily want to do to begin with. Right. The, you know, that, that, that sort of bit by bit, piece by piece, let yeah. humans have the big creativity and engagement, and that's exactly what you're talking about here, and I think that's what Cisco is pushing, right? Yeah, for sure. It's, like, it's definitely a tool that is going to accelerate and enable and create new efficiencies and opportunity, but it's also something that we have to pay attention to, and the human has to review it, right? I look at it as a thesaurus on steroids at some right. points, right? <laughs> like, you still have to check, like, is it giving you the right word for the context that you're trying to do, even in these very powerful, large language models. You do have to review it, and I think people are recognizing now, and this, the awareness is critical, right? People are finally recognizing that uh, these LLMs or large language models, they are beautiful writers, but they're not constrained by the truth. Ooh. And so, so you have to make sure that it's accurate and fit for purpose what you're using it for, but it can write wonderful prose for you. <laughs> I love talking to you, Harvey. The reason yeah. is you are such a good storyteller on this front for giving <laughs> people confidence in what's possible yeah. and saying, no, we've got some issues. We're working through those issues. We have the expertise to do that, but stick yeah. with us because it's going to get you where you need to go to the outcome right. that you're looking for. Such a pleasure to talk with you. I'm so glad that you had an opportunity yeah. to, uh, to join us here in the studio and I'm really glad that you brought this to us and to everybody viewing today. Great, thanks Steve. Congratulations on a great Cisco Live. We're going to take a very short break here at this point. Nish is going to join me in the studio, but right now Cedric is going to talk to some of the fabulous folks out there on the Cisco Live show floor. Take a look. Let's figure out what people think about Cisco Live. Let's go. <laughs> if I ask you three words about Cisco Live, what are the three words? Oh, impressive, powerful, and simple as well. Venture, a family, security. Interesting, fun. Forward thinking, getting to know your peers. High technology. Leadership. Good vibes. Training. Massive, eye-opening. Inspiring. Inspiring. Good fun. Cutting edge. Impactful. Awesome. Everyone could join. Magic. It's very busy. I found him. I found you. Well, I wasn't lost. Incredible. Incredible. Innovation. 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 Innovative. Innovative. Networking. Friendship. People. Amazing. Amazing. Amazing and amazing to be free. Amazing. Outstanding. So if you have to convince your colleagues or friends to come next year, how would you do it? Uh, look at me. <laughs> I don't have to, because we are all here. Well, I want because I want to, you know, come again, so they would just take up my spot. The uh, networking and the connections you can make here, along with the moments you would live, I think they are not something you can replace. If you want to go for the latest news, most interesting insights, uh, you definitely have to be here in Amsterdam. I would tell them that it's really nice and they had to see it. A fantastic way to meet with uh, partners and customers. Everyone's here again to kind of make a success story about how we can make everything a lot better, a lot easier for everyone. Go to Cisco Live. Let's go! I mean, really, if you are wondering why you should come to a Cisco Live, I think that says it all right there. Amazing, 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 all three of those words, and this really is a remarkable event. So please, we would love to see all of you at whichever Cisco Live you choose, or all of them, if you want to join us. That would be great as well. Great job, Cedric. Now, did you notice that Cedric was wearing a beautiful gilet? Uh, great vest as he was walking around and conducting those interviews. Well, he got that vest from the Cisco store, which is directly back over here behind me, and our own Cedric Devalder is, in fact, uh, back over there with our RF crew. Hello, Cedric. Oh, sorry, did we start? Oh, we're, we're live already? 
Okay, sorry, Steve. I was just uh, trying some new clothes, you know, I like shopping, right? Um, but yeah, as you said, um, it's not March delay this time. I'm actually trying to find another vest. So I'm here in the Cisco store and I just came out of a smart fitting room and just let's come in real quick because it's, it's awesome technology. Basically, based on what I'm wearing right now, the fitting room recognizes it and I'm able to ask for assistance. So you can see, I can just tap here. It's the jacket I have on right now. And I can be like, I think this size is actually quite all right, but I want to have a different color. Or, you know, I think, Steve, are you an extra large? Maybe I can bring one for you. Um, I can then basically request assistant and somebody will come in and like basically hand me the stuff. So that's, I think, pretty cool. I think we all know this issue that when we were like, you know, shopping and like, you're like, oh, where is someone to help us? I think this is really technology that can help that, um, that help with that process. So if you just go outside and I know our cameraman is gonna like, you know, don't fall over. Um, so there is so much to shop about at the Cisco store, but it's more than a merchandise store at Cisco. It's also to showcase the technology from Cisco itself and our partners. We'll have, uh, we have cameras over here. Um, let's just uh, have a look around here as well. We have cameras in the corner. Those are Meraki cameras. And then, of course, we have some beautiful uh, products here uh, from Polos. I need a new golf, golf polo, actually, Steve. Um, what sweaters and so on. On the other side, we have a new line as well. Um, actually, it's, this is quite funny. Um, I think they made this line especially for me because they put a C everywhere. Um, not really sure, and there is, Cisco, there is a Cisco logo on it as well, but I think they, they just thought about me, I think. If we go a little bit further, like the jacket that I have on, I think is really, really, really cool. So we have over here jackets for men, for women. As you can see, a whole range of collections, some nice vests. We have water bottles on the right-hand side as well, if we go here. Uh, and another cool part of the store as well as these price, oops, I'm breaking the store, um, is actually these price tags. They're also connected and it basically shows a little bit more information about the product and the price. So this can all be updated uh, remotely as well. So they'll fix it afterwards. Um, if we then go a little bit further over here, um, behind, uh, so our lovely shop attendees, oh, attendants, um, are always super helpful. But behind that, you can see that there is a Meraki display, and that display shows all of the cameras here, and they're, actu they're actually smart cameras as well. Um, smile for the camera. See, I said they're lovely, aren't they? Um, so if we go, we'll go here, because everything that is being sold in this store is made or is, is basically sold because it wants to empower an inclusive future for all, something at Cisco that we live by, right? So if we go a little bit further down here, um, a little bit, a little bit further. It's quite a trek. Um, there is a donation tab, right? So Cisco, the Cisco store is actually donating uh, to four causes on our behalf. We can actually just take one, put it in. Oops. And then basically, based on what's in the box, you can choose your um, your donation. I will make sure that we spread it evenly, just to be sure. So I think I did this one and this one. Done. We donated one euro to those uh, to those um, organizations. It's getting at, at the end of the week talking, right? Um, that's only what we saw, a very limited selection of what we sell at Cisco. So there is also the Cisco store online. Uh, you can visit that by merchandise.cisco.com. And until tonight, you can basically use the code Cisco Live Ship to get free shipping. And that is whatever you hear at the conference. You can use one of the tablets to fill it out and it will ship it to your home. Or if you're at home and you're dialing into the live stream, you also have the opportunity to use that code and you can get some uh, Cisco merchandise. We have some more interesting and cool stuff over here. Um, they always ask after the tour. So Kaylee is just around the corner and she's doing a tour right now to showcase. Um, they also use, um, they can also like show some of the um, things that people find most interested and that's with the sensors and cameras. Steve, I'm just gonna ask you, what are you most interested about when you walked into the Cisco store? What, uh, what uh, uh, sorry, I've got both of you talking at the same time. I missed that. What was that, Cedric? I'll just say it again. What are you most excited about in the Cisco store? Well, the I technology love front? the work. I mean, as an extra large person, I love what Kaylee Visconti and Brian Domine always set up when they're here at Cisco Live because it's not just on the retail side. Everybody thinks that the Cisco store is, I'm going to look through the books, the different authors that are here at the show. I'm going to look for, again, the retail pieces. No, this is actually a technology demo. It's an enormous demo, and it's showing all the latest and greatest within the retail space and sphere. I was with Kaylee when we 
we were at National Retail Federation. She and Brian had a fantastic talk at that particular event, and they brought all the different technologies on the security side, the distribution, the delivery side, the order chains, and it was just such cool stuff. And I also loved what you were showing there with the try-on outside of the room. I mean, I wasn't sure what you were going to emerge wearing or not wearing, Cedric, but it was really cool to see you coming out surprise, of that. Steve. <laughs> That's all right, no, no worries at all. Um, but I think the technology side of the Cisco store, to me, is the most exciting part of it, far beyond the retail offerings. All right, great, so Nish, um, yes. I wanted to come to you to talk about other parts of the hub, right? Yes. So we were just in the DevNet zone, we were over in the Cisco store. Talk to me about what's over in Hall 7. I never get out of here. This you is don't. what the bars are here for, <laughs> is to keep me keep Steve in. here. It's, it's, it's to keep, keep me in, bay. not to let anybody else in, it's just to keep me from getting out. Um, what have you seen <laughs> over in Hall 7, talk to me. I have loved the Cisco Showcase. Um, so that is where we have some of our biggest customer priorities here on, you know, on show at the event. So from um, you know, Secure the Enterprise, obviously I used to work in the security team, it's really great to see all the advancements and innovations that have happened just in a couple of years. Um, the transform infrastructure, reimagine applications, and of course hybrid work as well. You know, we've been talking about how to make the office more of a, a magnet, not a mandate, in the yeah. ways that hybrid work solutions are going to do that. And I think what I've loved seeing over there is something we've been talking about all week, like AI, how that's actually embedded into a lot of our technologies and solutions in through WebEx, through the AI assistant. Even today, you know, we're here. I'm missing a few meetings this week because we're here. Yeah, I'm not really missing out on anything because I've got the AI assistant giving me notes, actions, all the things I need to do when I get back. And I love it because it's making my job a lot easier to catch up. Absolutely, focusing on the positive. I'm glad that you brought up our different offices that we have around the world. When we were at Smart City Expo in November, uh, so much of what we were hearing about from Cisco was what we have done within our own offices, right? So as far as the back to work or as far as the hybrid work environment goes, all of a sudden these places are becoming remarkable gathering spots. Yes. Um, one of our great colleagues, uh, Davis, who uh, 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 he spent a little time in Chicago. So he's not based in Chicago, he's in Seattle, but he was in Chicago and he and I got a chance to visit. He had just come out of our Chicago office and said, I'm jealous oh, about this. I didn't I want to live this. there. No, yeah. it's just amazing. <laughs> um, I was also just talking with um, uh, Jonas. He was here a few minutes ago, a new gentleman that I had met out of the power office and he said you've got to come and look at what Cisco is doing with the Paris office. I haven't been there yet. I don't know how are things going in your territory on that front because I haven't seen yours either. I mean our office is, is also great. You know actually Steve I recently hosted a webinar for Cisco so webinars.cisco.com if you want to stay in touch with what Cisco is doing in this space and I hosted our Chief People Officer Kelly Jones and also our SVP of Workplace Resources Christian Bigsby and we've recently released a white paper with Deloitte talking about hybrid work and where it's moved to in the future of the workplace. And what I really loved is, Kelly is our Chief People Officer and Christian is our Workplace Resources Executive. They were talking about the foundation to it. It's not just thinking about you know, how to make it look pretty, or thing, but really thinking through from the ground up how what do you want the culture of your organization to be? How do you want people to work together? What's the collaboration culture going to look like? And then you build and you design around the people. So mm. it was so fascinating to speak about hybrid work and to hear from these executives how we've done it at Cisco. It's like a behind the scenes of the beautiful Paris office, of the Chicago office. And it doesn't start with the technology pieces. It doesn't start with a really cool office with free food. It starts with the people at the heart of it and then they build up from the culture they aspire to have, and then obviously going from there, the technology fits in, it's such an enabler, it's what creates such part of the magnet. And then obviously, you know, you see things like in a Paris office, we have that beautiful, like, you know, French culture, the architecture, when you marry those together on top of the people and culture you want to build, I think that's what creates a really successful uh, workplace. Couldn't agree with you more, Nish. I know I sound like a broken record when I say it, but when you amaze and delight the human being first, guess what corporations are made up of? large quantities of human beings, and we always try to play to that company benefit first, and I always let people know, no, pull back. Speak one-on-one -on -one to a fellow human. Make them happy, make them excited about what they're doing, inspire them to do better work, and guess what? You end up with a better corporate culture. Speaking of which, let's take a break from you and me. <laughs> I, I, okay, we've got a couple of different things. Which one would you like me to go to, Amy? We're going to go straight to Rob Live out there in, uh, where are you, Rob? You tell me. Oh, do I have to tell you? You have to I tell me, Rob. All right, well, let me give you a hint, Steve. There's a threat wall behind me. I was feeling threatened there a moment ago. Are you no, in knock territory, maybe? I am in knock, knock yes, land. You are. Yeah, I'm in knock territory for sure. All right, Lionel, correct? Yes. Make sure, welcome. Thank you so much. It's the first chance we've had to 
uh, ability to meet. You've been at Cisco a long time, though. Yes, I have been at Cisco a while. And even though we've been here at the Not Talking Technology, and feel free to talk technology, but I really wanted to understand more about how you guys have changed things from a people aspect. You were regaling me with some of those stories here, but start anywhere you want to with that. Yeah, so first I think uh, the main thing is talking about the team. So our team is, is a variety of people that comes from different places in Cisco. We are all volunteer teams of the NOC uh, in Cisco Live Emir, and part of it is come from people that joins uh, through the earlier in career program and the intern program. Um, and then in the NOC uh, team, we have different sections. So we start with the wireless section. I think you already talked today with my colleagues from bit. the data center side. Yep, lot and then uh, I'm more into the wired uh, network uh, portion. And then we have our security folks. And security folks, we can talk about uh, a bit of the tools here. But one of the things we have, we have done this year is really try to integrate the team into a single team, trying to do a better job at uh, Co working together to that, that one goal, which is making a network that works the whole time, that's the perfect network for, uh, for Cisco Live. And then one of the things that we saw is converging the tool set. So we started using the similar tool to de deployment, integrating the different tools together. So we started integrating, for example, our uh, Catalyst Center uh, for assurance for both okay. wired and wireless. In As the we past, should. we were using more for uh, wireless, and so now it uses the complete systems. Um, we also integrated the the deployment elements. Uh, I might uh, show you a bit later on some of the maps uh, tool that we have been using. But so. M converging the tools help us converge the teams uh, and have a, a better feeling of one team, one purpose. Uh, well, one thing that always jumped out at me is that you give, you provide opportunities for junior network engineers, yeah. I don't know, which may or may not be young people, but it often is. Can you talk a little bit about where, yeah, how many people are involved with putting an event like this together where do you get them from and what kind of opportunities does that present for them? Yeah, so the team is uh, overall 60 people uh, in wow. total. Okay. Uh, the team comes from a different uh, background in Cisco and there's different ways to join. Uh, as I mentioned, it's uh, all volunteers. And the way I joined was through uh, one of the graduate programs of Cisco. So Cisco has different graduate programs around sales, uh, CX and uh, TAC uh, or support center. Um, and I joined through the sales uh, uh, element and then every year we get people from both the, the, the junior sales engineers and from internships that do that they do in Cisco to join the team and help us because let's be honest the first things to do is trying to patch things uh, deploy if there's an issue we send someone to kind of uh, make sure that it's uh, correct uh, or the issue has been fixed uh, that's the first steps and then the people comes back in the team uh, over year over year and get more responsibility so that's why that's what my uh, journey was when I when I started and now I'm working on, on more of the larger but, architecture of the network. And it, it, it be my understanding I mean how many opportunities would you have gotten to do the kind of things that you're exposed to here I mean, it just doesn't come up that often, right? No, and it, it's not only the technology. It's, yeah. it's, it's So in Cisco... Working within a team at the yeah, very least. In Cisco, so, yeah. it's not only the, the technology, because we have this... Uh, this ability here to be able to meet people uh, that works in really different ways and that opens your social circle uh -huh. and your opportunities to to also not only work with brilliant people but also work with uh, people that are in different jobs so you can you get exposed to new jobs new opportunities new elements um, yeah this this is just an opportunity I don't think uh -huh. you, you find anywhere else well we were teasing the threat wall a little bit yes. can we step over here show yeah. me uh, first of all I just like the colors and I like it draws I saw <laughs> Denise over here uh, fish was presenting quite a bit she always had a crowd but she's not here now so can you tell us kind of what's the big picture story we're showing here yeah so here we are we are showing uh, the different elements that we collect as an information to know about the, the, the people and the things that are happening in the network so here we have our kind of control center of uh, XDR which allows us to kind of dissect incidents it, it takes all of the information from the different elements so yeah. this year we added a uh, additional firepower in the core to be able to span all the traffic of the venue. So we added capacity to be able to really span the whole traffic that you guys are, are going to the internet with yeah. uh, to be able to detect incidents. So you can see here that some of the system has detected some incidents, some have been contained, some have been assigned to people to review. Um, we do actually very few uh, enforcement of policy. We do that through uh, Umbrella DNS. Okay. But for the rest, we, we consider ourselves a little bit of a service provider for people, yeah. uh, but we monitor. And if there is anything that we see uh, as an issue, we take action. So you're not hard shutting them down? You're not no, we resetting. are more finding the people and, and explaining what they should be doing differently uh, than actually shutting yeah. them down. So we have a lot of monitoring on what things are, are happening, but not necessarily uh, enforcement. Well, I know you can't tell me everything, but I'll just try it anyway. <laughs> are there been any stories that have popped up? I know, you know when you build a network this size, you've got so much, such a variety of vendors 
most of which are really need the connectivity to even be able to put their demos forth. Yep. And that's certainly how Cisco's doing it as well. Because that's what I think people forget is that all the demos that are here, yes, there's equipment. Most of that equipment's not working. Most of it's just for show. The rest of it's happening off-site somewhere else. And that's just a more efficient way to work. But sometimes it also introduces challenges. Yeah, and, and some people don't necessarily understand. The people that come for the demo don't necessarily understand how the demo works and what the, the requirements are for that demo in terms of uh, need uh, of, of network needs. Yeah. And so we always have a, a challenge between what do I, uh, what do I request as in, uh, as, and what do I need? And right. so people come on site and, oh, my demo doesn't work. How, how can we get that fixed? So there's a lot of discussion and finding a solution that works for both the way we designed the network to work and also a, a way that works for the demonstration. So we have things mm -hmm. around, uh, oh, I plan my, to use my, my uh, corporate VPN to access, which is not allowed on some of the desktop here, uh -huh. uh, versus also people just uh, didn't realize that they were using AWS or some of the other elements uh, there. So I think there's a lot of, of different things and then people also forget they might be running some software they shouldn't be running uh, right. in a corporate event. Yeah. event because I'm sure you probably work with them in advance before they come here, yes. but at the same time, as we all know, when we work with people, yeah. the reality sometimes can shift. And I'm yes. interested also, you guys pre-build this network here in Amsterdam yes. to ensure everything's working, you're powering it up and make sure everything arrived and is working the way it's supposed to before you come back and do it again here? Correct, so we, we actually staged this network uh, in the Amsterdam office. Uh, it's funny that it's in Amsterdam the same. We have actually been doing that into the, uh, the Amsterdam office since Barcelona. Uh, I can actually show you some of the network. We just got about 30 done. seconds left, okay. but let's take a look. I love, uh, I love show and tell. <laughs> Sorry. Absolutely. Um, so you might be seeing here uh, the diagram here of the, of the network. Um, and so all of the things that you see almost so in this about over diagram, here? yeah, okay. all of the things that's on the upper Excuse half one of it uh, here is actually staged into uh, the Amsterdam office, into flying racks or rolling racks. Um, okay. And so we test everything uh, from that point of view. So every network portion, every element that we have, uh, we test also new software things around. So this year we deployed new wireless access point, the 9166D1, and we are using software like uh, resource, uh, radio resource management uh, things. The new RM so we stuff, test yeah. those new RM stuff all in Amsterdam office, oh, wow. and then we ship it here. Or when it was in Barcelona, we ship it to Barcelona. And then when we come on site, we spend a few days to plug everything back on and uh, do that. But, yeah. Lionel, thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Appreciate your time. Appreciate what your teams have done here and sharing all this information. You know, it's funny, two things that he didn't mention, but I know they've got a party tonight. They, with all the young people and all the hard work, they work 24 hours a day. They've been here much longer than anyone else because they're first on the scene. They're going to party like rock stars. They've got speakers and lights and geeky stuff that they're ready to do tonight. But then they also have a thing that I always used to enjoy going to quite a bit. I haven't had time. I'm going to be gone by this time tomorrow. But they have a, a review where they go through with all the vendors and the key leaders of each of the technologies that are all working together in the NOC. And they openly share with the audience what went right, what went wrong, how we built things different, what happened with our connections, who's our supplier, that type of thing. Great stuff in the NOC. It's very much part of the culture of Cisco. That's it for the NOC. For me, Rob, back to you in the studio. Steve? Rob, thank you so much, my friend. I appreciate it. Great job, as always. Next up, we are going to replay our innovation talk that asks the question, is your organization AI ready? How can you manage, secure, and scale your AI-powered technologies? Vijoy Pandey, Senior VP of Outshift by Cisco, is joined by Anurag Ingwa, Senior VP and CTO of Cisco Collaboration, along with Fletcher Previn, Cisco's CIO, to talk about the different ways that Cisco is strategically approaching key pillars of AI security, collaboration, observability, and services management. We have got so many learnings from our own IT security and application leaders. They have worked through amazing challenges at scale to deliver amazing Gen AI solutions. Let's hear all about them right now. Enjoy. Good afternoon, everyone. So I know all of you are here to talk about the two-letter acronym that's on everybody's mind, AI. But we are going to focus ourselves on generative AI, not the broader topic of AI, but focusing on generative AI. I'll have Anurag and Fletcher also join me on stage in a little bit, but before that, let's dive in and figure out what can generative AI do for us? So if you think about generative AI, just open up the aperture to what you've been accustomed to so far. 
So it is a piece of technology that actually allows for generation of content, for summarization of content, or for transformation of content. So any kind of content, whether it's text, whether it's visual, so images, as well as video, or whether it's audio. And if you think about text, it could be code as well, because code is a part of text. Increasingly, what we're also seeing is that all of these modes of content are merging into the model as well. So models are increasingly becoming multimodal. So when you think about use cases in your organization, don't just think single mode, think multimodal, because you will be blending text to speech, text to video, text to code, and so on and so forth. So think about it in terms of multimodality. Now, since so much can be done with generative AI, we found out from the AI readiness index, that's this Ryan a couple of weeks ago, that 97% of companies really are under pressure to build something that is Gen AI first and deploy those solutions in their organization. But only 14% of organizations are actually ready for it. And there's a reason for this. The reason is that generative AI is actually evolving pretty rapidly. And so as it evolves, if you think about building solutions, it's hard to keep up. It's hard to keep up with the model evolution that's happening out there. It's hard to keep up with the safety needs of deploying these applications. It's hard to keep up with the scalability requirements, with the security requirements that align to the policies in your organization. So that's why it's very difficult for organizations to keep up with the pace of generative AI that's happening out there. And by the way, it's true for everybody. People who are in the weeds in generative AI, the people who've actually invented transformers and generative AI also are having a hard time keeping up. So you're not alone. So take comfort in that fact that you're not alone. But if you think about the journeys that you need to go through, we've tried and categorized it in four buckets here. And just assume that you will be in all of these four buckets every given moment in time. So the first bucket is you're just consuming that piece of technology. So if it's an app, chat GPT, you might just be consuming it without customizing it. The second bucket is extending it. So let's, take, let's say you take our foundation model, but you want to make it specific to your organization's needs. To do that, you'll have to bring in knowledge bases and data sources that are specific to your organization. Let's say you're dealing with finance, and you have a question about finance. You need to feed in data which is specific to finance in your organization for that model to be able to answer those questions. So that's extending what you're doing. Then moving, you might be customizing it. So to customize it, you might start with the actual model itself and fine tune it to make sure that it suits your needs. Finally, if you are one of the daredevils that are AI first, you might actually build the foundation model yourself. So that's the last bucket. Typically, what you'll see is enterprises where we all belong. If you're not planning your birthday party or if you're not planning, planning your travel itinerary, you might be sitting in the second, the third, and the fourth buckets. Because just consuming an app as is is probably not as relevant to organizations. You might need to customize it in some shape, way, or form. But again, like I said earlier, you will be in each one of these buckets all the time. You'll have tools that fall into each one of these buckets all the time. So as you think about all of those deployment modes, and if you think about how to develop apps or how to deploy some of these tools, what is it that you usually go through? First and foremost, you need to figure out use cases. What, what makes sense? What are the use cases that you need to pick to experiment? And if you're new to experimentation, the only piece of advice I would give is just jump in. Jump in, pick a use case that has a low cost of failure. So if something goes wrong, no big deal. Because if you don't jump in, the first thing that happens is you don't know what you don't know. And once you jump in, you realize it's not just the skill set gap that you might have. 
It might be the data gap that you might have. It might be that the pipeline that you're trying to build needs to come from various places, not just one vendor, but various different vendors. So all of these gaps, you will not figure out. It might be policies that your organization has put in place that disallow a few tools or don't let them work the way you would want them to work. So you do need to jump in. You need to pick a use case with a low cost failure. And then you start thinking about what next? So let's figure out my KPIs. What do I want out of this deployment or this use case? And if I deploy them, what is that before and after metric that I'm measuring? I need to start thinking about safety. Is it going to hallucinate? Is it going to output toxic information? What kind of guardrails do I need to put in place so that it's safe as well as secure? And then you start experimenting. You start building a sandbox. You start looking at how these things behave. The application behaves in that stand sandbox. And once you're happy, you deploy at scale. And once you go in production, you need to worry about scaling, cost, security, and so on and so forth. So you usually go through all of these steps to actually make a generative AI use case real. What we are figuring out is people are jumping in, which is a good thing. They are on step one. Steps two, three, and four are really, really difficult for people to grasp. And so here we are going to bring up a few people on stage in a, in a little bit who've actually done this at scale at Cisco, and we can talk about challenges that they've faced while doing this at Cisco. But the other complication in deploying some of these Gen AI workloads in your organization is that it's a multi-organizational problem. So you have the builder, the people who are actually building that use case. They want to run really, really fast. You have the spender. Usually it's the GM, or it could be the IT team. And in our case, we'll talk to both the IT team as well as the GM of the organization. And they want to know how we are doing. You might be spending a ton of money sending tokens to OpenAI. Are you getting the response that you needed? Are you getting a good before and after picture? Is there good return on investment? And then finally, there are approvers. You need to make sure that your data is safe, your information is safe, but also you need to make sure that your customer's information is safe. You need to make sure that there is no bias that is inherent in your models. You need to make sure that they're secure. You don't want somebody else to come in and hack your LLM pipeline, and things can go awry at that point. So all of these personas need to come together to make sure that your rollout is safe and secure, and it needs to be done pretty rapidly. So with that, what I'd like to do is invite Anurag who's our SVP and CTO of engineering in collaboration for WebEx, as well as Fletcher, who's our CIO, to help and talk about how they have dealt with AI in the enterprise. Because in Cisco, we think about AI deployments in two categories. One is productivity, which is how is Cisco itself benefiting from the tools that are generative AI first? and improving our productivity, as well as a builder like Anurag, who's using AI in his WebEx portfolio day in and day out to build some nifty features in the product. So Anurag and Fletcher, please come on board. Thank you, Vijay. Thank you for joining me, and let's have a conversation. Both of you have been deploying a bunch of these tools in Cisco, as well as building a product right. using generative AI in WebEx. So let me start with you, Anurag, and can you help us understand the kinds of features that you've built in collaboration using generative AI? Absolutely, thank you for asking. So we've been using AI in WebEx for a long time. You know, We have features like audio noise removal and virtual backgrounds and so on, but uh, we're specifically talking about generative AI, so let me uh, talk about that. Uh, recently, we've added an AI-based assistant in WebEx, and that's going to be available across the whole portfolio. So all of the products in the WebEx suite, as well as our contact center, are going to benefit from this AI assistant. And to give you a few examples of what it can do, 
Um, if you were at the uh, keynote this morning, uh, you saw Jitu talk about a little bit of this. To jog your memory, uh, one of the productivity boosters that the AI BS Assistant enables is this capability to catch up very quickly. So you might uh, have joined a meeting a little bit late, or you were in a meeting but you had to step away for a little bit. Uh, the assistant is always active, and so it can help you catch up on what you missed. And you can have a follow-up conversation with the assistant, so you can, uh, for example, ask if anyone took your name, if anyone gave you an action item, uh, and then at the end of the meeting, uh, you get a, a nice summary and uh, insights uh, out of that. So that's a very simple, straightforward, uh, obvious example, but a huge productivity boost. Um, if you think about uh, another capability where generative AI is very good, it's generating new content. And so this example that I'm uh, sharing now is the ability to rewrite a message and make it better. Uh, and this is uh, something that I do quite often with my team. Before I send a message, I want to make sure that you know, I'm friendly, I'm inclusive, and I'm getting my point across, uh, but really uh, make sure that I can cultivate my relationship. So AI can help you uh, do, do that as well. Um, and if you think about the admin persona, uh, people who are managing these deployments, uh, the AI assistant can be uh, quite a bit of time saver there as well. Uh, Jitu talked about this example uh, this morning as well. Let's say I want to troubleshoot a problem with a call or a meeting quality. Uh, I can just engage in a dialogue uh, with the AI assistant in WebEx Control Hub, uh, and it can uh, bring all the relevant information uh, at my fingertips. And you were earlier talking about generative AI in the context of audio and video and, and other things as well. So this is an example where I'm asking a, a text-based question, but the assistant comes back with charts, and uh, it's truly multimodal in that sense. And uh, so these are just a few examples, but like I said earlier, AI is going to be embedded across the whole portfolio in WebEx, and it's going to be pervasive in everything we do. So there are a lot of companies out there that build right. AI-first solutions. Yeah. How is Cisco any different from any of them? Yeah, that's a very good question because almost everyone in the industry is talking about assistance now, right? Like that's uh, the most obvious uh, first step that everyone is taking. Our approach is slightly different because we think very deeply about how people communicate. And when you think about how we communicate with each other, there's a part of that communication that is text-based. Emails, chat messages, SMSs, and large language models are very good at summarizing those, extracting insights out of that. But a lot of communication happens in non-text modalities. Um, you know, people uh, communicate a lot with gestures and reactions and tone of voice. And if you're not capturing that information, you're really missing out on a lot of context. So this is why we've introduced industry's very first real-time media models that can capture all of that context that is happening in audio and video. And then when you combine that with large language models, you can deliver some amazing capability. So that's what sets us apart. And then one other thing I'll say is, given our heritage in strong audio and video capabilities, we've recently announced uh, a brand new audio codec. When you think about you know, those assistant capabilities I was showing earlier, if the assistant cannot hear you properly, it won't generate a good transcript. And if it doesn't have a good transcript, then the summarization will be pretty poor. So fundamental problem is how do you get crisp audio and video across the network? especially under heavy uh, packet loss conditions. And so that's where we're applying generative AI to reconstruct packets on the wire and deal with uh, any kind of network condition. And, and that's like another example of how we differentiate. So can you also talk to us about a few challenges that you faced? Because this journey is non-trivial, as we just discussed. Yeah, um, you touched upon some of those, but from a very practical point of view of what we have done, uh, I'll start with data privacy as the first uh, principle, because at Cisco, you know, privacy is a uh, core of everything that we do. And so when you're building these products, you have to make sure that your customer's data is protected. How do you make sure personally identifiable information or IP uh, uh, does not leak to especially any of these LLM vendors if you're integrating those unit products? Um, another thing that becomes very interesting with generative AI is safety. And uh, imagine a text-based interface, a prompt-based interface. How do you make sure that the responses that come back are uh, not uh, in such a way that are going to drive some, uh, you know, some bad behavior or bad responses or, or hateful speech and things like that? So you have to make sure you have guardrails there. Um, another one is a classic AI problem that uh, is very relevant to generative AI, which is bias. And this is where, you know, at Cisco we have a very well-established responsible AI program. We show you are the executive sponsor, so you know uh, all about this. And this is also, uh, you were talking about cross-org uh, collaboration. This is a perfect example where we have a, 
uh, a responsible AI program that guides how we build, uh, build products. And then I will also uh, add cost as a vector here. When I'm building products, I want to make sure that uh, the cost isn't prohibitive, that I don't uh, you know, uh, really jack up my prices to such a level that nobody can benefit from these uh, productivity gains. So how do you build an architect system in such a way that it can be um, you know, uh, manageable from a cost point of view? So those are just a handful of uh, challenges that we run into. So let me come to you, Fletcher, and you have been rolling out Gen AI tools within Cisco for more than a year now, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your philosophy? I mean, and give me some examples of some of the tools that you've rolled out. I mean, I'm a user of sure. some of those tools, but where do you want to take it, and what's your philosophy and strategy? Yeah, the philosophy is to think about AI um, as a teammate, not as a replacement for people. So somebody, you know, a, a technology that gives people more time, makes them more productive, a force multiplier for what you're able to get done in a day, and um, you know, sort of a way to think about it is, if the industrial revolution was about physical products and mass producing physical things, AI, and in particular generative AI, might be kind of the industrial revolution for knowledge workers. The mass production of information and learning uh, and ultimately returning time back to people to spend more time doing the thing you were hired to do and less time doing the stuff that we all just feel like we're wasting time doing because we work at a big company. Um, so we've rolled out uh, some of the obvious things that you would probably have also rolled out. Uh, Copilot for GitHub, in the process of Copilot for Microsoft 365, ChatGPT, uh, but doing those in controlled ways, like ChatGPT is running in a private instance where we use the Azure PII API to remove any uh, identifiable information from the prompts that anybody might put in. Uh, we also keep that all in our network so none of the data gets reused for public training data. And then use technologies like uh, retrieval augmented generation to combine the benefit of a large language model with the proprietary data that we know about our business. So think about things like TAC case data, Cisco product data, uh, you know, can we make that chat be able to answer questions like, what is the PoE budget of this switch? When does this router get end of life and which one replaces it? I'm a salesperson, help me write an email to the CIO of a big company about why Cisco firewalls are better than Palo Alto. And then not use public data to do that, but our private data from Salesforce and sales enablement material and things like that. Um, the other big one you know, that, that is interesting is Copilot for GitHub. I think historically we all thought um, software development is probably the thing that AI will never be able to disrupt. AI is going to disrupt these lower order jobs like HR, task oriented things first. And software development is just human, human beings' creativity and their brains and it's never going to be able to do that. Turns out AI is very good at writing software or writing code uh, and it's one of the first real use cases of making developers more efficient and so right now 47% of all code being checked into GitHub is being augmented by Copilot or some other AI. And by the midpoint of this calendar year, GitHub says 80% of all code being checked in will be helped by AI. And so now, you know, you've always sort of thought there's no way to compress software development. That's why we all focused on things like CI CD pipelines, test automation, because that stuff you can automate. Uh, you can actually compress the amount of time that it takes to write software, which is allowing us to really do more with less. So that's just a few examples of, uh, but oh, the intranet, we're building a, um, uh, an LLM enabled digital equivalent of a friend who has worked at Cisco for 20 years and knows everything. So you can go to the intranet uh, and, and sort of, you'll be able to interrogate it and ask it things that if you were a new employee, where do I find this? How do I do that? What's the answer to this? And it will just know all those answers. Giving you the answer is one thing, but it will be able to do those things for you and actually take the action. So Fletcher, I actually want to thank you um, uh, because you have been a very progressive IT organization and you helped us adopt these tools when a lot of the enterprises take the posture of uh, say, just saying no because there's so many risks involved. Can you tell us a little bit about your thinking process 
for being so forward looking and enabling us with that. Well, luckily, and by the way, I should have said, we are, of course, also using the, the AI features of WebEx, which we use every day, a huge productivity enhancer, uh, and uh, some of the AI ops in things like Catalyst Center, formerly known as DNA Center. Uh, that helps my infrastructure team a great deal. But I think when we have these conversations with the responsible AI team, with legal, with security, um, the easy answer is, we cannot move forward until we know all of the answers to every question that legal has, all, all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. The problem is, um, you know, if, if you do that, you're gonna get left behind. So how do we do this in a safe way uh, where we're protecting our data, and as much as we worry about our data, we really worry about your data, we gotta make sure that is taken care of, but the philosophy is, um, we're genuinely excited and curious about what people will do with this technology. So of course we have to make it available, but how do we do that in a safe way where if, we're, if I'm doing my job well, people are not aware of any limits that we've imposed on them because people are not trying to do anything that they shouldn't be trying to do. And we're just enabling people to do what is required for their jobs. It's kind of the same approach to security. If you're constantly running into security controls, there's a problem. Really, you should be able to do your job and not be aware of any of the guardrails that are in place because you're not doing anything wrong. And it's sort of the same here. So, you know, don't put, um, we allow people to go out to the public version, for example, of ChatGPT. But when you do it, you get a pop-up in the browser saying, if you're doing this for anything related to Cisco, you should be using the internal version. And if people paste something into the browser that is personally identifiable information or Cisco proprietary or Cisco confidential, we'll get an alert on that and we'll know about it. Um, and, and so, you know, there's just, it's a, it's a um, discussion with legal, with security, with HR, uh, to, to get to the goal we all want, which is, isn't it gonna be so exciting to see what all of our employees are gonna do with this technology? So I know we've all talked about that chart that I showed earlier. As you can imagine, there's, uh, we are building something from scratch, so everything from the models themselves, yeah. all the way to the application, which was the fourth bucket, to what Fletcher was describing earlier, where you're taking a model, taking a chat application, and customizing it with some of the data sources that are specific to Cisco in our case, to make sure that it's relevant, it's specific, it's relevant, and it's recent. Right. And so that entire mode, all the four modes are something that we all participate in all the time. And so with that, what I'd like to do is, uh, we are also announcing this, sorry, this is uh, going the other way. So we are announcing a new product called Motific, and Fletcher here has been very helpful in being a customer zero and helping define this, and so has Anurag because of all the experience that they've used in building out the product. The whole idea behind Motific is, like we were all discussing, it's a multi-organizational problem. So how do we bring all of these organizations together? From the end user, to the GM, to the builder, to the approver. Can we bring all of these personas together, as well as all of your organization's specific data sources, policies, identities and so on, so that there is one place, a central hub, if you may, where you can come in and this hub will help you rapidly and safely create and deploy your generative AI solutions. So that's what Motific is all about. And with that, let's roll the video. The Gen AI landscape is uncertain, a constantly shifting terrain. But organizations must engage with Gen AI or risk being left behind. Introducing Motific, a complete software solution that provides the Gen AI innovation you need. With Motific, you can build trustworthy AI quickly and in compliance. Its centralized control gives you command over all your organization's data in one place, alongside enterprise-grade governance and oversight. Motific provides a window into your organization's costs and usage while accelerating your Gen AI deployment from months to days. By unifying permissions and controls, Motific gives you Gen AI tools that apply trust, 
cost and access management across all the providers you use. From a strong foundation comes unlimited possibilities. Accelerate your organization's Gen AI journey with Motivic, powered by Outshift. So if you think about the early days of cloud, this is exactly where we are with AI as well, generative AI as well. You'll have these organizations that are trying to run fast. How do you make sure that they run fast, as we've heard today from both our speakers here, our guests here, as well as making sure that central IT teams have the controls that they need and the visibility that they need to make sure that you're not crossing the boundary or the line somewhere. So that's what Motific provides. If you want to learn a lot more about what Anurag talked about or about Motific, these are some of the sessions that you can go to and you can also come to our booths where we have the demos as well as talks on some of these uh, ideas that we just discussed. If I might add, uh, because you, know, you talked about how we uh, sort of contributed and inspired to this. So one of the challenges that we've uh, been very aware of as builders is that the state of the art here is moving so fast that you want to maintain optionality. You don't want to lock yourself to a provider or a model. And it is very important for you to architect your product so that you can switch things out as the state of the art progresses forward. And a product like this would be a, a, a huge enabler in, in maintaining that uh, optionality. And the policy controls that you, you know, the video was talking about is also very, very important. Because when I'm building a product and selling it to thousands of customers, they all have their own policies, like Fletcher has the policy for Cisco. And so building a product that is flexible enough to adapt to all of these customers' policies is actually a very hard challenge. And then we went through this process, and so I'm glad that we finally are codifying all of that in a product so that the next developers are, are going to find it a lot easier to do that. That's a great point, Anurag. So I think if you think about a product like this, I mean, the things that you brought up, first and foremost, the abstractions right. that you need to be vendor agnostic. So whether you're using ChatGPT or, or GPT, rather, or BARD or an open source LLM, it doesn't matter. Making sure that you have the policies and compliance and controls at your fingertips. Making sure that you have trust and safety taken care of as well as your ROI and costs under control in one place, I think is super important. And everything that we are learning from both the IT and deployment side of the house as well as the application development side of the house actually feeds into a product like Motific as well. So it's, we are drinking our own champagne when it comes to, when it comes to Motific. But uh, yeah, thank you for being here. And we have to run, unfortunately, after this, but you can catch us at the collaboration booth. I think Fletcher is around as well. Uh, I'll be there at the Outshift booth. If you have questions, happy to answer them at those places. But for now, we'll have to run. But thank you for coming in and listening to us. Thank you. Welcome back to the Cisco TV studio, coming to you from the beautiful Rye here in Amsterdam. Cisco Live 2024, Cedric, I cannot even believe that we have reached the final broadcast of this year's event here. It is a wrap, yeah, it, 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 here in EMEA, this is amazing. We, it feels, honestly, half an hour, 45 minutes ago that we kicked things it, off it right here in this studio by. space. It Absolutely. really does fly by. But I think the reason that it flies by, it's the nature of the energy of this particular event. It is so strong. People are in such a good mood. It's really hard to convey that. I know we always seem like we're in a good mood and our energy is high, but you walk around at this particular show and people are just loving being here. And this is everybody from the attendees all the way up to the executives and the people who run this event. I mean, it's also because, you know, in this hybrid work, hybrid work world, I can't even talk anymore. You and Amy <laughs> there in the back, our producer as well, she's just sort of on the way in the door and yeah. I can't even talk anymore. <laughs> um, so, we in a hybrid world right now, right? We work from home so much, Steve, and I think it's great because I think, you know, to be here, because you can bump into colleagues that don't live close by, that like, you know, live somewhere else in another country, and it just allows you to connect, and I think there is no substitute for human connection, right? As I, as I hug you throughout the week. <laughs> <laughs> the uncomfortably long Cedric hug. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. We are on global teams these days. Yep. And I feel like so often, even when we were in office before we hit pandemic times,
teams. Our teams kept getting more and more and more diverse and more scattered, not necessarily siloed. It's just that we had to keep up with each other's calendars and schedules. And when half of your team is halfway across the world, all of a sudden we get a Cisco Live and it's our opportunity to come yep. together as a Cisco society and really gain that return to being with one another. I, mean, I know I look forward it's to it. A, it's an extension of our WebEx platform, right? I think I work at Cisco, so it's, it's just great to have that technology and it was great to hear about the innovations that we're doing on the platform as well, right? But it, there, I still think there is no substitute for it, right? It's just, you know, I can come and stand next to you and touch you and do that <laughs> and so on. So it's just, you know, I just think there is absolutely, yeah, it's just great. I know I'm what so glad saying, that you actually demonstrated that for everybody who's watching here on the broadcast. Like there is not some invisible glass and I'm actually sitting in a different studio no. somewhere than you no, are there. It's a hologram. <laughs> it's a hologram. Speaking of hologram, no, we're not going to go there out on the show floor for those of you that didn't get a chance to see it before. This is a people first event. For those of you who have never had the opportunity to come to a Cisco Live, we talk about this over and over again. It's great that you're with us on the broadcast. We love that. We want to make sure that we keep you here with us. And by the way, do keep reaching out on those social media platforms using hashtag Cisco Live EMEA. Our social media team will keep looking for those throughout the rest of today, but onward as well. We want to hear your commentary. But there really is something about being here in the room, the vibrancy, the energy, sharing the food, going for a coffee, taking a seat out in all the different areas. We're going to go to the bean bags in just a moment where Nish is hanging out in a different part of the show floor, right? But it's all about getting together in the room because that's where the creativity comes from. It's where the innovation comes from. And again, we're creating fantastic technology, but you know where it starts? There starts here at an event like this, or the one in the US, or the one in APJC. Yeah, the US one is also not too far ahead from us, it's right? not too far off. I think it's in June. So that will be awesome. Uh, but yeah, as you said, it's just, it starts here, yeah. right? And we heard so many great announcements from our leaders about the technology from, from, as I said already, collaboration to security and in this ever-connected world, I think Cisco is going really fast. And I'm just so glad to be part of it and like to be able to explore while we're here at the conference and learn about our newest and greatest technologies. It really is very exciting. Speaking of which, I want to go out to Nish, who is out in the world of solutions, I think in the beanbag area where people are hanging out, right Nish? I am indeed, Steve. The only thing is I can't find Rob, I can't find Sandy, I can't find Brandon. I'm a little bit concerned, but oh dear. Okay, guys, Rob, Rob, oi, you're always sleeping, come on. Broadcast live now. What? Brandy, Sandy, Brandon, up, 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 up. Come on, guys. Right. Up, 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 up. <laughs> right. As usual, gonna... Rob is sleeping. Producers, this is new. They don't normally sleep on the job. What have you done to them? Um, <laughs> I didn't know they were there either, to be honest. This has been a great show. How have Hello. you been? How have you been? Good morning. Shouldn't sleep oh. with those contact lens in, yeah? No, that's not a good idea. Uh, All right, now you're up. I can yes, ask you a question. I'm ready. And of we can bring the real value to the viewers who are watching this broadcast. What has been your favorite this week? Great question. Um, I would say the keynotes are always a highlight. Yeah. They're always a spectacular show. The music, the energy, the atmosphere, the tension because no one knows what announcements are going to be made. Mm -hmm. And then obviously sitting down with Oliver in the studio for our interview was super fun. Yeah, uh, well he's a fun one to talk to, I think. And yeah. So a lot of great people as usual this year. I, obviously AI is what we've been talking about this whole week, but one of the things that really jumped out at me is just all the work that's gone into full stack observability. So when I think about the technology aspects of things, I think about how we're bringing together the importance of this visibility at all levels of the network. The technologies that we used to do this are really coming together nicely all the way to the end point. They're just dissolving lines between these silos that become important for getting work done. And so I just like what we're doing there. Yeah. You, you know what else I learned this week? What's that? How to change a brake on a bike. Do you know how to change a brake on a bike? I did not learn how to change a brake. <laughs> I was there briefly. So I build a bike, right? You and did the, the, yeah, the build a bike. Yeah. You were actually fixing brakes? Exactly. So what they're doing there is all the other attendees can play a role in building a bike from scrap bikes, and then they donate those to Give a Bike Foundation, and that goes to local causes here um, you know, social causes. Yeah, here those are like Amsterdam, discarded Amsterdam. bikes, right? Exactly. And then they're giving them new life. And exactly. They, and I've seen they pull a lot of them out of the river here. People either lose them because of the wind. I don't know if they ditch them, but there are a lot of bikes in this town. You've got to watch your step. Now, what was the best meal you've eaten this week? There's so much on offer, right? Wow. See, I didn't spend much time eating this week because we've been busy <laughs> running around. I don't know. The food's been really good. It's we've been had, awesome. um, 
I think you brought me some pizza a little bit earlier, I did. and I was thinking this pizza tastes a little bit different than what I'm used to. It was very good. It was something great. in the wheat. <laughs> I don't something know what it is, <laughs> but I, 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 my favorite food is always the one that's within hands reach. Hands reach, yeah. exactly. And did you check out DevNet this year? I know you love oh, yeah. to interview De DevNet. I had a good time talking to them. DevNet to me has uh, started to really infl uh, uh, both embrace and drive the culture for what's important both from a people and a learning aspect, but also youth, where's the technology going? How are we preparing for the future to live in a programmatic world where things aren't as nailed down and hardware specific as we've always had them in the past? Uh, it's just a nice confluence of things coming together. I like that. I think I'm going to go ahead and throw us back to the studio for now. So guys, we'll check back in. Rob, thank you so much. Nish as well. What you guys have been talking right uh, about for the past couple of moments there is the culture of this particular show. And Cedric, this is what a lot of people I think don't know about Cisco as a corporation, right? They look at the products, they look at the services, they look at what they can do in partnership with Cisco, and they see us as a gigantic technology company, which they should. We are the leader, we are uh, uh, kind of the, you know, the big power there in the room, but what they don't really understand is the culture of working with this organization, that the people of this company are what this company is all about, right? Well, if you think about it, this whole conference, like we, we keep in mind sustainability everywhere. Um, I think at Cisco we're so big about inclu empowering an inclusive future yes. for all. So I think one thing that I want to call out and I want to say thank you to those people as well that are here is we have crisis response teams on the, on the show floor as well. And basically what they do is they help people in need and areas in needs. And they use Cisco technology to get networks up and running, to get IP phones up and running so that people who are, let's say after an earthquake or anything like that and the systems are down, they basically help getting the systems up again and, and allowing those people to connect. So actually we're really changing lives. I love that. Uh, Marvin was in here a little bit earlier. He and I had an opportunity to talk and he was speaking about what we do in support of human beings that part of the inclusion that is so important is that we're not just checking a box when we talk about that. We recognize that that inclusion makes us stronger. The more people we get together in the room, the more diversity of thought, the more creativity, the better we tend to innovate and the yep. better we are responding to not only crises but also demands within the marketplace. This is what we do at Cisco. We're always about about feedback, we're always about learning, we want to hear from people, what is it that you need? How do we help you reach the outcome, the success outcome that you are desiring? And whatever we can do, we're going to make that happen. And speaking of talking to people, do me a favor, I want you to introduce your own Vox Pop video. <laughs> I introduced you last time, what did you do to put this piece together? Uh, so basically, uh, I always find it fun to go out on the show floor and to basically, uh, as I always call, annoy some of our <laughs> attendees because not everybody thinks it's fun, but for me, it's, I have a blast doing that. And basically I asked them this time, what's so amazing about Cisco Life? So let's roll the VT and have a quick look. Let's figure out what people think about Cisco Life. Let's go. If I ask you three words about Cisco Life, what are the three words? Oh, impressive, powerful, and simple as well. Venture, a family, security. Interesting, fun. Forward thinking, getting to know your peers. High technology. Leadership. Good vibes. Training. Massive, eye-opening. Inspiring. Inspiring. Good fun. Cutting edge. Impactful. Awesome. Everyone could join. Very busy. I found him. I found you. Well, I wasn't lost. Incredible. Incredible. Innovation. 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 Innovative. Innovative. Networking. Friendship. People. Amazing. Amazing. Amazing and amazing. To be free. Amazing. Outstanding. So if you have to convince your colleagues or friends to come next year, how would you do it? Uh, look at me. <laughs> I don't have to, because we are all here. Well, I want because I want to you know, come again, so they would just take up my spot. The uh, networking and the connections you can make here, along with the moments you would leave, I think they are not something you can replace. If you want to go for the latest news, most interesting insights, uh, you definitely have to be here in Amsterdam. I would tell them that it's really nice and they had to see it. A fantastic way to meet with uh, partners and customers. Everyone's here again to kind of make a success story about how we can make everything a lot better, a lot easier for everyone. Go to Cisco Life. Let's go! go.
Go to Cisco Live, let's go. That really sums it all up. I always say that our guests, our visitors, our attendees, our customers, our partners, they tell the story the best. It is an amazing, remarkable experience. Cedric, you did such a great job out there with everybody. It's quite hard, Steve, sometimes, because I asked them three words for Cisco Live. So many of them actually gave me like whole sentences of why they love to come. So but I love the, the woman that said, amazing, amazing, amazing. That's how I feel when I come here and when I see you and the crew and, and all, of, all of us were here. Couldn't agree with you more. Again, it's a dynamic that's here in the space, which is why we really would love for all of you who are tuning in to the live stream to be here in person with us so you can come and visit us here in the Cisco TV studio. All right, we've got about one minute where you and I are going to talk about our single favorite space here at the Waz, I'm putting you on the spot. What was your single favorite space? You get to pick one. Ah, it's so hard, Steve. I know. It's the store, isn't it? I was going to say that, but <laughs> you... I'm going I'm to try another one. I okay. think uh, it's, it's, it's our collaboration zone. I, I, I love collaboration. If you've tuned in over the week, it, uh, you know, I talk about it quite a lot. I was really excited to interview some people about it. So I just love it how we basically touch the end user with our products there. Excellent. I am going to pick, because I have such a close relationship with them, Outshift by Cisco. I love what Outshift is doing. There's this whole idea that where Cisco ends, Outshift begins. It's this idea of where do we go next? What is the big idea? And we talk about this all the time. A lot of our customers say, well, what's my next big bet? What should I be looking for? What should I be looking forward to? Outshift has got that story, and I've had plenty of opportunity to talk with our Outshift leaders, and it's just been a fantastic experience. I think another great area that we want to point out, Rob was over there quite a bit this morning, was DevNet, and DevNet, is actually celebrating a great anniversary. So we're going to go out to the floor where Rob is with the DevNet folks. Hello, my friend. The significance of DevNet at Cisco is that there's not really another game in town to programmatically interact with our products and solutions. If you're a command line you know, interface person or you are utilizing you know, web interfaces, whatever it is, at some point you're going to want to do automation, at some point you're going to want to do programmability, and DevNet is a way to not only educate you in how that's done, but also enables you to go build your own solutions in that space. So I think that, that we've got a unique role here at Cisco. Back in August of 2023, celebrated 10 years of DevNet. And it's an unbelievable milestone for this organization. It's great to look back over the last 10 years and look at what's taking place where it's either learning labs or sandboxes or the, just the overall API quality and experience that Cisco has grown. And it's just fantastic, the community that we have built of people that are helping us learn about their use cases, but also we turn around and help educate them and enable them to do what they're doing. We're going to continue doing the things that we already do, and that is to continue building and interacting with our community of operators and developers and network administrators who are trying to come and understand how to programmatically deal with Cisco stuff. But we also have this unique opportunity to add in brand new personas, cloud native personas, and security operations teams, and even full stack developers who now need to understand infrastructure. We also have new technologies. We're bringing in artificial intelligence programmability, sustainability programmability. These are all things that we can add into what we're doing in the next 10 years and beyond. And happy 10th anniversary to amazing DevNet. Congratulations to all of you out there on the team. I know I mentioned that we were going to uh, throw it over to Rob there in the DevNet. We don't need Rob. DevNet tells its own story so beautifully and we're really excited for every single one of them. Um, congratulations and we look forward to telling a lot more DevNet stories. We're going to head back out somewhere to our own Nish Parker. Nish, where are you now? Hey Steve, I'm here in hybrid work and I'm joined by Kim. Kim, I can't believe it's the end of the week, how are you doing? Doing great, uh, Nish, sorry about that. <laughs> doing great, we've had a very busy week here at the Hybrid Work booth. Um, way more people than we anticipated actually, and it's been really exciting. We've had um, a lot of people come with already using a lot of the stuff. They love this wall, this has been the big draw, this wall, people like to touch the products and see the products. So um, we've had tons of people come over and say like, oh, I have this and I have this, but I don't have these other things. Talk to me about it. So it's been really good. We've gotten lots of leads, people who are saying yes, I want someone from Cisco to call me. We've heard about um, new and interesting applications that we haven't even thought of yet. So it's been really good. 
Awesome. And you said this is your second Cisco Live, I think. And you said it's been a while since you joined the last one. So what's new this time? What's changed? Uh, I would say it's more fun. This is more fun. There's more gamification. There's more, um, you know, people sharing and just, just. I just think it's more fun than, you know, the last one I went to was a little bit more business oriented, professional. You know, this is just, like I said, we got games over here and there's snacks and there's just, yeah, and the music and yeah, it's more fun. 10 years later, it's more fun. Amazing, I love it. And I can see my co-host Rob is just being Rob really and just dancing around in the background. I have no idea what he's doing, but Kim, just... <laughs> <laughs> but Kim, just give me one reason why people need to come to Cisco Live next year if they're not here now. Uh, the products, and you got to learn about all this cool technology. I mean, this is the future, right? This is the future. We're measuring air quality and environmental stuff, and we're teaching you how to make your buildings smarter and conserve energy. I mean, this is the future. Got to come. <laughs> we're Cisco. We're Cisco built the internet, and, and like. You've got to be here. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kim. All right, back to the studio. Thank you so much, Nish. I appreciate it. Uh, great to have a little extra conversation out there on the show floor. For all of you here on the live stream, I would love to for all of you to understand just what it takes to put this together. It is an enormous operation. I am here on set the entire time, and I get to hang out with Malcolm and Mike and Mark and uh, Alex and Ali and the crew here, and then in the back I've got Pete and I've got Alfredo helping me with the audio. That's just who's around me most of the, uh, of the week. Then in the back we've got all of our amazing producers, Simon, Erica, Carrie, Amy V, Amy P, incredible people. Rob is going to take us on a little tour of exactly what it takes to put this Cisco TV broadcast together. We're going to take you behind the scenes right now. Rob, take it away. Well, I wanted to give you a behind the scenes tour here at the Cisco TV studios. And this is the very, very back. This is where the equipment is set up and only the engineers are going to be messing with this stuff here, starting with all the optical networking. Of course, we've got the Cisco network that supports all the connectivity in here because there's as many as three to four large sources coming from the keynote space, from the iTalk, from the multiple studios and remote camera systems that we have. All that gets fed through here, processed in the control room, which I'll show you in just a moment. But the point is, this has got to be collapsed and then encoded properly for where it's going, which would be Cisco.com, be YouTube, and all the other sites in which this stuff is simulcast. But then there needs to be a quality check on the streams themselves as it comes back around to make sure that all of you are getting a good experience, of course, watching from home. And that's what this team is responsible for. They've got a wireless RF team. It's one of the ones I've been out with this entire time, where they've got antennas set up in crucial primary areas around the venue. And that enables us to do audio, video, as well as communications handled here so that we can communicate with the producer and whatever it may be. These guys enable us to make those adjustments. Now, a lot of information has to be captured and then edited on the fly. So there's only one editor solely working here, trying to carry it all himself. So in just a moment, we're gonna take a look inside the producer's area and take a look at what gets put on the screen from the studio. Starting over here, what is your role one more time? Oh, I'm looking after records and the hot head camera. So all those cameras get individually recorded and he maintains all of that here so we don't miss a thing. As we go a little bit further, Here's our engineer for the show. He is making sure that all the cameras are balanced, the colors match, or he's prepping all the graphics that then come up for our director. Carrie's in control of absolutely everything here. So she's got this big board. She's got to choose all the shots. So she's got previews of every camera. She's got countdown clocks to let her know how much time is left on a videotape being played in. So on this table here, we've got lighting. Very, very important. We've got producers who are making sure that the show that was promised is the one being delivered. Over here, we've got wonderful, one of my favorite positions is audio, because nothing works, but this doesn't work. We've got makeup, and here we've got our beautiful host. Nish is here getting your makeup, and these ladies take care of making sure that we don't look shiny on camera, that everything, we look wide awake, despite what our last night was involved in. Either way, thank you so much, guys. You do a wonderful job. Let's now go back out. Here they've set up two studios for this year, which is really quite nice. As you can see, we've got multiple camera positions here. We've got our floor director, Ollie, over here, making sure everything is ready to go. We bring guests out, pre-position the host. Here we've got another one of our hosts, Cedric, is prepping for his next interview. And then we've got a separate set over here. So very intelligently, the cameras can go back and forth to pick up different things so we can stage differently. And so that's the studio. That's your behind the scenes look at Cisco TV. Hope you enjoyed it.
Thank you so much, Rob, fantastic. That is maybe the quickest tour that we've ever been able to take. Like I said, you have no idea of the complexity that it takes to put this remarkable broadcast together. 50 people here just working on the Cisco TV team, and they really do a brilliant job, and they make us look phenomenal, don't they? I just want to say a thank you to everyone because it's always such a blast and it's a great team as you said and we kind of, at Cisco itself, we're a family but I think the Cisco TV team, in it, TV team in itself is also a family and I always love hanging out with all of you guys. I'm just going to look at who I can see. Exactly. Yeah, thank you. I wanted to, by the way, add one more shout out of my own. I know we walked through the makeup area. Lucy Vick, thank you for making us look phenomenal and Lucy, especially thank you for playing with my hair all week long and uh, I think we've gone through 19, 20 cans of hairspray. It is, otherwise it kind of flies all over the place. All right. We've got um, about, uh, oh, you know what? We're going to head right on out to RF and the uh, Health and Well-Being Zone. Miss Nish, are you out there? Actually, you got Rob, Rob out here. I never yeah. know who's doing anything. Oh, there Rob. we go. No, there you, you are. No, you don't need to know because we're going to tell you what's happening. We've got a little bit of a contest going on. Nish has been talking some smack about her golf skills, especially as it relates to using clubs that have, what do you call these, clogs? Clogs. So, Nish. You demonstrate for us here how this works. Steve, if we can swing around, let's see if Nish can get this. You've got, take your first swing, let's see how close you get to the hole. You ready? Okay. Careful, don't overdo it. Don't, don't, I should stand back. This is looking. <laughs> that probably helped you. All right, that's good though. Look, you're playing conservative. I think this is going to work out great. Guys, if you ever get a chance to come by the health and wellness zone, this is a place where you can come to recharge. Maybe a little healthy. Yeah, there you go. She did it. Only three strokes on a par one. I don't know. But uh, either way, this is a fantastic place. I don't know why he's pedaling so hard. Oh, maybe it's because the only way he can make that blender turn. Come take a look at this. Are, how, many people, how many people over here are depending on that blender? Do you get to drink it or are you doing it on behalf of everybody else? That's for your drink. You get to drink it. Y'all are waiting to pedal your own? Everybody leaves. They go, camera guys here. We're out. All right. So... Y'all have no electricity. Is that how this booth works? Exactly. This is sustainability at its finest. Yes. If you're going to drink it, have you already? I did this once and I learned don't try to do that and talk at the same time. I don't think these shoes are very practical for smoothie making. But you, you look fantastic. Thank I you, know. Rob. But I do want a smoothie. I have to come yeah. back with my sneakers on. So this is where you come to recharge the health and well being area. Yes. Pedal for your food. I think that's a great move, especially in this town. Exactly. Either way, we'll go back to you in the studio, Steve. Day. Oh, sorry, hey, you're Steve, back to me. This is great. This is how you know it is our final broadcast. Everything is going sort of a bit haywire. We're all just talking to one another. You caught me in the middle of chatting with, uh, with my producer on this one. Um, so, all of the fun that they're having out here, you'll notice that there are a few less people out there than there were in previous broadcasts. You know why? Because everybody's on their way to the customer appreciation event. Yet one more fun thing is the big party that we get to do here on the final night of the conference. And boy, they put on a good show here. I went and had a sneak peek, Steve. Uh -oh. I walked in with my event staff batch and I just had a look and it. it seems amazing. I can't wait, 6.30, I'll see you there. Okay, we're going to go back out to Rob and Nish, I believe is what I heard. Are people dancing? Is this what I, what I just heard a moment ago? You They're reminded trying. me of the party, and so Nish had the little tune in her head. I don't know how, but I heard it. And then and we I'm were like, just oh, I know that dancing one. along I to you. Yeah. And also I dancing to the pace of the bike. Look at this bike. guy multitasking. Yeah. He's taking phone calls while making breakfast. I know, that is, that is talent right there. But it's the way you get stuff done. This speaks to the productivity being enabled by everything here. It comes in the oddest places the health and well-being at the very least. For I may sure. take a banana. Can I have a, <laughs> have a banana, as they say? So I have noticed we picked up oh, on each you. other's accents, the way that we speak. I say router sometimes. You yeah, what is a router? You put things in the bin and not the trash. A router? A router. A router. Yeah, I said router. But we are forever learning the spirit of Cisco life. Perfect. All right, well, I'll let you throw back. <laughs> yeah, let's head back to the studio. Steve Cedric. Get that banana and walk your way back on over here to the studio. We miss you too. Come on back with us, Nish. You were wearing the shoes. I appreciate that commitment. I really do. Um, what we're going to do right now, Cedric, is we're going to take a moment to check out a highlights reel, um, some of the really fun stuff that we've been doing. So yep. uh, let's go ahead and go to that right now. Enjoy. Welcome to Cisco Live.
Let's go. And that right there is Rob with the <laughs> world's famous <laughs> banana. Ah, oh, you never know what's going to happen. Banana? Wait a minute, that's for me. Give me the banana. Give me the banana. Give me the banana. The banana lives here with me. Thank you very much. I appreciate yes, it. Boss. I never get out of here. you got to bring me something. What you just saw, that oh. is why people want to come to Cisco Live. And I want to give one quick shout out because we didn't do it before. Oh, Editing banana. on these video pieces has been brilliant this week. <laughs> Bravo. I mean, seriously, they've been just fantastic, fantastic captures. So thank you. Hi, friends. Welcome Hi. back, you crazy, Hi. chaotic, high heel miniature golf playing human beings. Yes, can we just say though that I was pretty tame and I'm like, I keep an eye on Rob. When you send Rob and Cedric out, who knows what's going to happen. Well, it's I'll very true. <laughs> well, the two of them misbehave, so at least when the two of you are together, you can keep him. Aww. When you don't have to wake him up out of a beanbag. My friends, <laughs> I cannot believe we are at the end of the broadcast. Thank Another you. fantastic Cisco no. Live in the books and an opportunity to share time with you beautiful human beings. Truly, truly appreciate it. And to you, Steve. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. You'll miss my hugs. I will, I promise. <laughs> I will miss your hugs. Until next year, or the way it goes. All right, guys, we have just got about a minute and 45 seconds left in this broadcast before we put the wrap on it. I'm going to give you each one opportunity, like we do at the end of each one of these shows, oh. one opportunity to call out one fun. Oh, thank you. Because we get teary eyed. <laughs> Dab now. We absolutely will. But, but what about one makeup? favorite thing, Nish, I'm going to start with you. You get to pick one. Go. Being able to bring this beautiful, wonderful, however many square feet of wonderfulness to everybody at home. Bravo, I love it. Cedric, you go. I think it's working with you all. Boat here and boat back there. Absolutely. <laughs> all right, Rob. Are you, are you helping? I'll, I'll bring you back the banana. You're how sad. You here you go, fine, like, you take the banana. How does this do? Do you do the. Is that to keep from messing up the makeup? When you yeah, do it's fine. It's all right. Yeah, Lucy's oh. bigger on their way out right now. All right, <laughs> favorite thing. One. Yeah, favorite one. Thing. One thing. Sleeping on the bean bags. <laughs> that, that really was your favorite. It uh, was you, up till I wasn't. You say you <laughs> saved the best to the last. All right, my favorite thing, and I know this is going to sound so corny, it's when we get the leaders together here in this space, and I get to see their passion. It takes a huge amount of work to build yeah. this particular event. And yes, they're brilliant at what they do, and yes, they create phenomenal products, and yes, they have phenomenal teams. But they come here and they show us what they're all about. They show us their incredible energies, and I just find that remarkably exciting. I think it's great, right, Nish? For sure, a hundred percent. I just want to say thank you. To you. You've been in that exact, you know, 30, 40 centimeters squared all week, and you have done a wonderful job in taking us out to the world of solutions, taking us out to the keynote. We've been running around. You've talking got to the producers in. on camera. Talking to the producers on camera. Thank you, my <laughs> sweet. I appreciate it. Once again, we want to thank all of you for tuning into the broadcast. We are so grateful to have all of you with us at this show and every single year. That is a wrap for Cisco Live 2024. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>